The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live from Washington, D.C., and thanks for joining us in our webinar today. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. This is the uh, beginning of the federal government fiscal new year. It's obviously October 1st, and we've got a great lineup today. It's a mix of both government and industry, and we're going to hear about best practices, and we've got it segmented uh, by topic. Uh, So we're going to Uh, dig into some of our slides here. Uh, We don't uh, take questions throughout the webinar, but it is being recorded. We'll send out the recording uh, as well as the link to the slides later this afternoon once we're able to convert the recording into a uh, MP4 file. So before we get started, just want to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, We're based in downtown Washington, D.C., and provide a variety of services for uh, companies that are selling to the federal government. We don't deal with state and local or education, just uh, the federal market. And so our clients typically come to us for anything from market analysis reports, business development. If it makes sense for them, we'll help them get onto the GSA schedule and manage that contract. Um, And then also that post award kind of back office compliance is another piece of our service. Uh, We do have a newsletter that goes out every Monday, which is perhaps how you found out about the event today, Uh, and that reaches over 23,000 subscribers, most of which I'd say 90% are probably government contractors or are government contractors. We've got some service providers uh, and then some government um, personnel as well who are subscribers. Uh, We've been putting webinars on for several years, and so we now have a a library of over 450 complimentary government contracting uh, webinars, and they cover topics uh, on anything from GSA schedules to business development, uh, and then a lot of the legal pieces such as uh, bid protest, um, uh, FOIA requests, a little bit of everything. So Uh, You can check out all of our recordings there on the YouTube channel. Uh, What we did in, um, just to rewind for a moment, in 2020, we covered every part of the FAR, which is the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and those uh, were uh, run through sequentially. So we started with FAR Part 1 in the first part of January and then ended with FAR Part 52 in December. Uh, This year, 2021, which has flown by, uh, we're kind of mirroring that uh, process and we're covering the DFARS. Those are Wednesdays at 12 o'clock complimentary. So we're more than halfway through that series. If you wanna listen to any of the recordings, you can find them on our website as well as our YouTube channel. We've also got uh, the second Friday of every month, a new, well, it was new for this year, uh, which is the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. It's the second Friday of every month. Uh, there is a small fee to attend, which is $35. If you use the discount code DFARS, you'll get a D, uh, $15, $15 discount. Uh, next Wednesday, we wanted to mention uh, we do have a special, it's complimentary uh, webinar in our COVID contracting series, and it's the vaccination guidelines for contractors and subcontractors, uh, which recently just came out. Uh, so you can Uh, Find that link uh, to register on our website under the uh, events section. Next year, we're covering, uh, in the same spirit as the FAR and the DFARS, the FAR supplements. Uh, It's a webinar series. We're going to have primarily government contracts attorneys who will go through basically the agency and the department nuances uh, that they have within their own department or agency regarding contracting and procurement. And then on that uh, corresponding Friday, we'll have uh, the Department of Agency Playbook Series. We're doing that in conjunction with FedMine, uh, Archie Zemihan and uh, their group. Um, so they're gonna cover some of the, um, the opportunities. We're also uh, doing this in conjunction with the McLean Group, which is a merger and acquisition um, outfit. And we will have government representation on most of those webinars as well. Sponsorships are available. One more thing I wanted to note is uh, a new series we're going to launch is called the uh, the GIP. It's the Government Industry Partners. Uh, And so basically it allows you to conduct a webinar with us. Um, We will help promote it, uh, help you curate it. We're going to host it. We'll record it. um, And then we'll post your webinar on our uh, website, YouTube channel. 
So you can do this as a one, two, or three part series. And so this will be all about your business. Um, so it's like today you'll present in front of a live audience. And as I mentioned, you get the recording, the registration list. Uh, so if you're targeting government contractors, this is probably a good service for you. Um, and I wanna make sure that hopefully everybody can uh, see my screen. Um, and so again, that service, this government industry partners webinar series is allowing you to conduct a webinar with us. Okay, um, just to let you know, uh, next Friday is this GovCon live Q&A cafe series that I mentioned. So every month is a different topic. Um, next Friday is covering set-asides. Uh, with the folks here you see on your screen, uh, most people that are in the government contracting sector are probably familiar with these names. Uh, and then in November, the second Friday is uh, November 12th, and we will cover pricing. And uh, Marsha, I believe, is joining us later today as we talk about best practices for uh, pricing. And then uh, we'll round out December with mergers and acquisitions uh, with these four panelists. You can sign up on our website um, for all of these. So just... Uh, Go to our website, go to the GovCon Live Q&A tab, and uh, you'll find uh, the links there to register. Okay, so today uh, we've got some sponsors that we want to thank. First up is C3. They've been an uh, advertiser in our newsletter for uh, a good chunk of the year. They've, uh, they're speaking today in our conference, and uh, just a quick blurb about them. Uh, they're a provider for uh, CMMC, DFARS, and NIST 800-171 compliance. Uh, Bill Wooten is speaking later this afternoon in the compliance section. Uh, Bit Solutions, uh, they are your go-to for uh, basically managing your capture process in a very uh, user-friendly uh, software uh, platform. Your point of contact there is Anissa Milner, and her contact information is listed there on the screen. She's also going to be speaking uh, later this afternoon uh, in the sales and capture section, uh, rightfully so. Uh, so her contact information is there. You'll see it also later in the slides. Next up, we've got uh, WorkPlan. Uh, they've been a newsletter advertiser for uh, several weeks um, in our newsletter this year. Your point of contact is Anita, and her information is there in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. They're a great resource for um, financial management for government contractors, anything from uh, your project and cost accounting to DCAA compliance and your incurred cost submission. You guys can read the slide and, and contact Anita. Uh, BitSpeed, uh, they're gonna share some news uh, with us later today. Um, Alan Shipes is speaking in our in the section as well with uh, Anissa Milner over in uh, Sales and Capture later this afternoon. Uh, another platform for managing opportunities. They're not providing the data, they're just helping you manage um, your opportunities in federal contracting. Another sponsor is uh, GovFlex. Uh, they're kind of the dating um, service for government contractors, meaning that they're gonna match the um, freelancers with government contractors. So uh, any freelancers that are out there providing maybe proposal writing, pricing, compliance, whatever it is you do, you probably wanna have uh, your profile listed and then government contractors can go in and uh, and locate you uh, in a matching event. Uh, Federal Business Council also a sponsor today. Uh, they are your go-to for uh, government contracting events. Uh, they host events uh, at federal agencies and they have been putting on, I think it's, I wanna say over 30 years, uh, the annual procurement fair uh, which usually I think happens in April. So uh, your contact there is Anthony Gargan. Um, and then uh, David Powell, who is the CEO, will be speaking later today, uh, also in the sales and capture uh, session. Gov White Papers, uh, our friends over at the Gov Events have uh, launched Gov White Papers, uh, also a newsletter advertiser. So thanks. Um, to the great group of folks there. Uh, you can upload content. Uh, it's a great platform just for uh, getting any sort of uh, government contracting verbiage out there uh, and reaching anyone from government uh, and military members. 
The Boone Group uh, is your go-to for employee benefits. Uh, they've been around for 35 years, uh, which obviously says a lot. Um, your contact there is Grant Elam. Um, his contact information is there on your screen in the lower right-hand corner. We want to thank the Boone Group for participating with us today. And again, uh, please go to them for your employee benefit products. Ocean 5 Strategies. Uh, Chris Brinker is your contact. She's listed there in the center of uh, lower center of the screen. She's speaking today in the marketing uh, session. And there you go to for digital marketing campaigns, planning, uh, websites, SEO, um, uh, everything. So uh, they're a great group to work with. Very easy, very friendly folks. Uh, highly encourage you guys reaching out to Ocean 5. And last, uh, actually, we've got two more after this. Uh, SWIC Tech, uh, they're your go-to for CMMC. Um, they are also a registered uh, provider organization and uh, do a lot uh, just on the IT compliance level. So uh, you've got contact information there in your top right-hand corner, and we highly encourage you guys to reach out to SWIC Tech for CMMC. Last but not least is First National Bank. Your two contacts are James and Justine, uh, listed there on the right-hand side. Um, they've got uh, 43 billion uh, full-service commercial bank and uh, a great group to work with. Um, so highly encourage you guys to reach out to First National Bank. Okay, and as we move on here, we're gonna dig into our agendas. We've got some opening remarks and uh, best practices from SBA. Candace Miles is kind enough to join us. Um, and then we're gonna go through each of the sections with the uh, the five experts. So Candace, uh, thank you again so much for joining us. It was nice uh, chatting with you as we were waiting to launch the webinar today. And I'm just gonna dig in here to your, uh, your best practices and let you run through those. So the floor is all yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I want to say good afternoon to all of the webinar attendees and thank you to Jennifer and team for, um, for inviting the Washington Metropolitan Area District Office of the SBA to speak today. My name is Candace Miles and I bring you greetings on behalf of my district director, Mr. Larry Webb, my deputy district director, Ms. Ray Mackin, and our entire office who continuously works tirelessly to serve the small business community. It's absolutely fitting to have this webinar to kick off fiscal year 2022. Happy New Year. And with that, I'm going to share my five tips on being successful in federal government contracting. My first tip is always to be specific. If you pop over to USA.gov, there's actually an A to Z index of US government and department agencies. And quite honestly, there are more than 137. Um, you wanna be specific and identify the three to five agencies you're interested in working with based on their mission and the services that they buy and the services that you offer. Um, the next thing I wanna offer is to always be succinct. You want to remember, um, you want to have clear, concise communication. And you have to remember the statistics right now says that it takes about 18 months or nine touches with a contract officer or program manager before you can be uh, offered or awarded a contract. When you're able to make con contact, you always have to be ready with the opportunities that you've researched and identified from looking um, either at previous contracts awarded or at the procurement forecast. And you also want to have a white paper that can explain your successes and how you can help the agency meet their mission or also be ready to explain your past performance history. Um, the next thing I always like to mention is to be smart. You always want to make sure that you price for a profit. I definitely don't recommend cutting your prices to get your foot in the door. Generally, if another firm has done it at a specific cost or if the government has done their internal government cost estimate, it's never a good idea to cut your prices. Um, that can lead to burning yourself out or getting burnt in the end. Uh, and something else, when we talk about being smart, we always want to make sure that as you're developing your business development or business capture management plan, that you do aim to have specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goals that you can measure and meet upon. The next thing is you want to talk about, I talk about being significant. 
quite honestly, in the federal government marketplace, if you haven't done it, you don't do it. You wanna be able to explain your past performance and demonstrate that you are experienced with contracting, whether in the government or commercial sector. You wanna be able to translate your non-government experience into terms that the federal agencies will understand. And in certain cases, it's always really important to be open to teaming or joint venturing where you can increase your capacity and your, or your capabilities to compete for contracts. And my last tip is always just to be sincere. People do business with people who they like. And especially in this COVID environment we've been operating in for over the last 18 months or so, um, people can tell in certain ways when you really enjoy your work and when you're being genuine or when you're just calling because you want something. Being kind and genuine can go a long way and it also helps to distinguish you amongst your peers. And so that's it. Um, when we think about government contracting, being uh, to be successful, be specific, be succinct, be smart, be significant, and be sincere. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Candice. And now, uh, what are the advantages of obtaining a federal government certification? Uh, obtaining a federal government certification will help you to compete amongst a smaller pool of people. So whether you are a women-owned small business, whether you're a socially or economically disadvantaged business, a veteran-owned business, or if you're located in a historically underutilized business zone, having one of these categories will allow you to compete amongst a smaller pool of people and not always have to um, go after opportunities that are for full and open competition. Great, and thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your, uh, your day and your weekend. Um, and thanks again to the, for representing the SBA today. Perfect, thanks so much, Jennifer. Have a wonderful webinar and thank you to all of the attendees. Thank you. Okay, next we're gonna dig into market research and looks like we've got uh, Archiza Meehan with us from FedMine. Um, so Archiza, thank you so much for joining us and um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump over here to your five best practices. Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer, for <clears throat> inviting me to this amazing event to start the new fiscal year. I actually love the tips that Ms. Miles just gave. I think they were truly on point. Um, this is the fiscal new year, last fiscal year. So far, we have about $528 billion that were awarded, um, not including the DOD contracts, which are subject to the 90-day delay. So it will be interesting to see if we close the last fiscal year at a higher amount than FY20 or lower. But as we start talking about market research, it is important to remember that the federal spending cycle is triggered by an agency need, which truly sets in motion the industry's predictable cycle of activity. Understanding the need of the agency is critical and hence, I think, the need for market research. Um, use market research to interpret the data to build the knowledge to help you grow. It is the foundation of your success. To win the business and grow, you need to know what opportunities to go after as you build your pipeline. Market research specifically will help you understand the agency, the vendors, and the opportunity and make the decision whether you really need to go after you know, whether if it's actually an opportunity, it's not an opportunity for this fiscal year and make those decisions, uh, which are so important. Um, and when we talk about agency intelligence, it's really getting to know who your target agency is. Uh, you know, once you know, understanding your buying patterns, knowing your forecasts, your exhibit 300s and 53s, you know, if there are GVACs that, that you might need to get on. All of that is important and it comes in when you start understanding and doing your market research on your agency. The vendor intelligence includes understanding your competition, your teaming partner, which we see a lot more of, um, you know, or looking at existing 8As that you might want to look at tying up with, understanding their vehicles that they're using, GSA schedules, the pricing, expiration dates of their main contracts, understanding if a company has actually filed any protests and what's happened, uh, you know, are, are, they, are there any legal proceedings happening? So there's a lot of good information that you really want to focus on 
Uh, and you want to put all of these elements together to create that actionable intelligence and that helps you be strategic as you grow your pipeline and grow to be a very successful business. Those are my little tips. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I think I accidentally advanced to the, your uh, question here. Uh, great point. And uh, what would you say are the data sources utilized most to perform market research for the federal marketplace? So, um, you know, in addition to uh, providers such as ours that integrate all the data, I would say there are a lot of, and your website actually has amazing resources for all the places and data sources that we could look for market research. But uh, SAM.gov uh, has all the opportunities and now the award data since it's the front end for FPDS. FPDS, of course, USA Spending also has some really good information, especially on the subcontract data. Um, agency websites have some, you know, good information on their forecast. Some agencies are better than others. Um, learning the agency budgets, it's super interesting because you see so much in those agency budget documents. And then, of course, our company websites and the LinkedIn profiles give you a lot of insight into what a company is doing. So I would say these are all data sources that we can use to create the foundation of our market research. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, nice to um, have you on the program today. And um, yeah, uh, we appreciate your time and your help. Thanks, Archiza. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Next up, we've got uh, our longtime friend and colleague, Eileen Kent, with uh, the Federal Sales Sherpa. You've got her contact information here. And Eileen, hopefully you're, uh, you're live with us. Hello, everybody. Jennifer, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's so great to be on with everybody and already great value so far from um, the, the speakers before. So the couple of best practices that I wanted to talk to you about today for market research, we heard some good things, which was know, your, know who your three to five agencies are. But how do we begin doing that? Well, when we look at the data and we want to go out there and search the data on who buys what we sell, we need to sit down as a team. So you want to sit down with your team and identify some critical keywords for what you do because you're going to use those keywords to go to these data sites to search the intelligence of who buys what you sell. So I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. In furniture, for example, you might want to write down the word furniture, but they might have inside the data, inside the description of requirement, chair, desk, workstation. But then if you think workstation, you go, wait a minute, that could be an IT workstation. So we need to kind of double check that data when we look at it. Um, credenza, training room, surgical furniture, bed, mattress. So whatever type of furniture that we're selling, we wanna kind of dig deeper in the keywords that we're actually gonna to use to do the data search. Now in services or IT, for example, I do a lot of data dips for this and people give me the keywords program or project manager. And I gotta tell you that those are such general words. I might as well type in, you know, um, painting because every single building needs painting, right? Um, so when we do project or program management, it's too general. If we're doing database and um, IT related things, we need to have deeper things. Like if we said cloud, we've got to siphon out words like cloud that's part of clouds, like in the sky in NASA. So we want to maybe put in Java programmer or Spelunk as a software. And if we decide to look for hardware, we want to say server, monitor, keyboard, blade, hard drive, cable. We want to be specific on these keywords. I don't like to do data dips for NAICS codes because there's so many NAICS codes for what you do and a lot of NAICS codes that start with the word other. So I use keywords to do data and intelligence and I also want to do a peek at who your competitors are, are getting business from. And in the data these days, it was just recently changed. It's not vendor name anymore. It's legal business name when you're looking for this information. The other thing I want you to think about when you do a round table with your team on uh, keywords is to think about the step before they buy what you sell. 
So for example, back to the furniture example, maybe you do a data dip in contract opportunities for GSA leasing space or moving or construction projects or build and alterations, because if they're gonna do that, they might need furniture, right? So think of the step before they need you for your data dips as well. And as you've already heard, you know, you wanna do a data analysis and then see who bubbles up top, see who buys the most of what you sell and focus on them. And as you've already heard, SAM.gov is a great site there. They have an ad hoc report. USA Spending, you can pull data. You can also pull subcontracting data for your competitors if you wanted to look at that. And of course, you can always buy a subscription service like FedMine and others that are gonna be talking to you today. Um, but what I do and what I always emphasize is it's great to have this information, but you've got to build a focused action plan around those three to five departments, the agencies, the location, and the people within those agencies, and you actually have to execute it. You got to pick up the phone and use the data that you've uncovered to have intelligent conversations with your clients. They spend a lot of time putting that data up there. So if you go in saying, who are you working with? They're going to look at you like, really? You're going to ask me that? It's the usual suspects. Go do your homework. So do your homework first. And then when you're asking questions, you're going to ask deeper, um, more detailed information from their procurement forecast, from SAM.gov, from the contracting opportunities, and be able to speak to them in, in terms of what's happening at their agency. Better intelligence makes you a better salesperson, getting a deeper understanding of what the story is on the ground. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Eileen. And how good is the data out there? I got to tell you, it's like a dream come true for salespeople who know what they're looking for. You can uncover who buys what you sell, from whom, how they bought it, what type of set aside it was, how many bids they received. When the contract comes to an end, it goes on and on and on. There's almost 300 data elements per contract. Now, when I look at this data, I, I bring it down to about 50 because those are things you can act upon that make sense when you're in the field. The data is outstanding. So go and dive in there and give it a try and best of luck to everybody. And I hope you have a great day today. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Ellie. It was great to have you on the program. Appreciate the insight. Thank, thank you. Great. Next up, we've got Jack Siney down in the uh, sunny Florida area from GovSpend. Uh, Jack, it's great to have you on our program. And uh, I'm going to just bounce over here to your uh, top five best practices. Hi, Jennifer. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, great job, Artisha, Eileen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the time, Jennifer. Thanks for the opportunity. Hey, I, I just want to piggyback on what Eileen said, because um, I think the folks, you'll have a variety of data sources today from the sponsors and, and the folks that Jennifer works with. So I I wanted to focus a little bit more on the execution part of, hey, how do I actually take my research and, and, and get to a deal or win a deal or where should I do market research? And so quickly for me, number one, we always talk about having a flagship agency. That's somebody that loves you, appreciates what you do, and they will say and carry the torch for you inside the government. And so a lot of times as well-intended, super smart uh, sales folks or, or owners, we can say great things about ourselves, but when an agency loves you, you over-service them, they will tell other agencies. And so I just wanna encourage folks, instead of trying to maybe get deals in a couple spots or looking for a, a variety of agencies, find one that will love you, loves what you do, will say great things about you. And then my next one, which could seem kind of odd to some folks, I know in the federal government, they talk a lot about like capability statements, but as Candace mentioned in her intro, a lot of times it's about relationships and the government not necessarily, is not very excited sometimes to be the first user of a product or service. And so just encourage you to go get some third party validation, go get some press coverage, some outside sources that'll say good things about you and your company. Um, it may sound like a weird thing, but when you send somebody, hey, we were on the cover of the paper, we were had this big article in some magazine, it really helps validate you as a company and agencies are more uh, more likely to use your service or your product because again, somebody else has already seen it and, and uses it and works on it. Uh, my third one would be, you know, don't spend a lot of time and energy working on an RFP unless two things, really one, if, if you've helped scope the RFP, obviously we all know that, that would be wonderful. 
And then secondly, you know, trying to have a creative angle or unique offer to the agency because uh, for most things, the government's purchased it numerous times or has a sense for who they'd like to use. And so can you do something creative to make them move toward you as a vendor? It can be super powerful. It could be a service offering. It could be a 24 seven return policy or support offering. It could be things that are service-based, but find something that's really unique to you and your company, which would be great. Uh, number four, again, as, as Candace kind of kicked off today's webinar with, highly encourage folks to find a socioeconomic classification that works for you. Because one of the things folks may not know is that once you do for one federal agency, other federal agencies will typically find you as well. So getting in the door as one of the classifications that are out there, a woman-owned business or a veteran-owned business or service disabled or 8A, you name it, um, that when other agencies are trying to meet their requirements, they're gonna contact some other agencies and say, hey, do you have a vendor that does this? Do you have somebody that did a good job for you in this area? So that ability to, to, to qualify and get certified for one of those classifications can open a lot of doors in opposite, instead of you having to always go find opportunities, sometimes they'll come find you because they have a, a purchase they have to do in a, in a kind of set aside way. And uh, they'll actually go and find you as a company, which is a great call. We all love to receive those calls inbound, uh, you know, sale, which is amazing. And then lastly, um, you know, I just don't want to uh, have, have us forget about what's happening in COVID. We've kind of all semi adjusted to this new work environment. I want to encourage folks when you're doing your market research and looking for things and trying to tell your story, um, just acknowledge that a lot of folks are still not in the office necessarily full time. They're all doing somewhat creative things to get their job done. And you trying to modify your normal sales process to accommodate that by putting things in video format, uh, getting them uh, date elements. We know we can't really go meet with folks much anymore. And so trying to do creative things so that they hear your sales pitch, get to know you, get to know about your company, encourage you to spend some time thinking about that because it can be a huge make or break item uh, now that kind of the normal sales process maybe that worked for the last decade or so uh, not, not necessarily are so relevant today in this COVID era as we continue to adjust. So those would be my five kind of operational execution things I'd recommend for folks. Great, I love it. And uh, always good to have uh, have you with us, Jack. Uh, what would you say is the best way to get press coverage for my company or solution? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so I, just really, really quickly, I know there's a lot of guests coming. I would just say this, the media, imagine if you work for a, a news outlet or, or you know, even as us, as we try to put out content every day, it's hard to come up with new ideas and new stuff so if you approach any of the news outlets with, with a story that's about the citizenship, about their constituents, they're super likely to pick up your story. So don't call and say, oh, I want you to do a puff piece of my company. But if you say, hey, this is how we help the your community. This is how we help the constituents that are actually read your newspaper, read your publication. They're very, very, very likely to pick up the story because every day or every week, they have to find content pieces that are relevant. And so if you serve it up to them on a platter in a very neutral way, uh, I would say seven out of 10 times they're, they're likely to take you up on the offer to do a story because, again, they're always trying to have, they always have a need for new ideas and uh, they love when kind of one or two are handed to them. So that would be my biggest suggestion. All right. Great. Thanks so much, Jack. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the day and great weekend. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks. Okay. Next up, we've got uh, Nicole Tripodi from Fed Inform. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just dig into your top five best practices. And you might be on mute. Let me double check here. Uh, Nicole, hopefully you can hear us. Um, can you hear me okay this way? There we go, yep, thank you. Okay. Well, today everybody has broad access to federal contracting data and information. The business development advantage has moved from access to information as an advantage to the ability to curate actionable information as an advantage. So here are five skills that will move you closer to making sense of all the data. Skill one, write research questions before beginning market research. Truly effective market research helps us solve business problems. So first identify those problems and craft them into research questions. So let's say we have a business development approach that's mostly reactive to bluebirds, those unexpected, unplanned, and unprepared for competed opportunities. Here's an example of how I would turn this into a research question that will help us get ahead of the opportunity before it drops. 
what contracts are expiring in fiscal year 2022 that are likely to be set aside for small business, have a total contract value between five and 10 million, and were awarded by the Department of Education. Now, my only job is to find the information that answers that question. Skill two, avoid research rabbit holes. A research rabbit hole is when we become distracted by chasing information that's interesting and not relevant. This is about staying focused. Each time we receive access to a new database or receive a new offer for a market research report, we ask ourselves whether this information is information that should be curated in order to answer our research questions. So over time, we develop the ability to make very efficient decisions, but as we're getting started, we can write down our research questions and track our steps. Skill three, learn advanced research techniques. Examples of an advanced research technique could be building a custom report from free source databases like the Federal Procurement Data System or Boolean searching. And why this is important is because research reports and databases are designed for consumption by a large audience. Our advanced research techniques parse information so that it's specific and it's relevant to us. Maybe a market research database can pull down a list of likely competitors for an opportunity, but our advanced research techniques can further identify specific contracts our competitors are likely to use for past performance when competing an, on an opportunity. Skill four is overcoming unfamiliar report findings or unknown language. So we often find ourselves in a situation where the data just doesn't make sense. There's an easy trick that helps us draw better conclusions from our market research. And it is this, because most of the databases that curate federal contracting data rely heavily on the Federal Procurement Data System or FPDS, we can check out the FPDS data dictionary whenever we get stuck. It's a great resource available right on the Federal Procurement Data System. And here we can learn about federal data, its meaning and how to interpret it. And then skill five, leverage traditional and non-traditional sources of information. So if you've been in GovCon for a hot minute, you've already heard about market research tools like USA Spending and the Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS, but there's other resources too, sites like it-dashboard.gov and calc.gsa.gov for pricing data. There are published documents like agency strategic plans and Office of Inspector General reports. The bottom line is to get creative about how we can use all the tools that are at our disposal to curate the information needed to answer our research questions. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. And now we're gonna pop over to your, uh, your questions. So what is the role of the business development analyst? A business development analyst is an individual in a business development support role that knows the resources that we discussed today and also has the research skills that I just went over. So this is an individual that has the skills to curate and make sense of market research information. So a very good business development analyst can source opportunities, um, support most capture management efforts, and even supply proposal teams with information as direct inputs to the proposal. Things like information about the customer or about the environment or about our competition. Um, business development analysts in the DC area typically have salaries that range from 70 to 100K and sometimes more for really advanced skills and capabilities. So a question that I often receive as a follow-on to this one comes from small businesses who wonder how they can compete against firms who have somebody with these skills and talents on their bench. And I think that building a strong internal market research capability is accessible to companies of all sizes. And a lot of times it comes down to a business decision, whether we're gonna do it ourselves, assign it to an existing employee, hire a new employee, or hire a third party. Great, thank you so much. If you guys wanna reach Nicole, her contact information is here on the screen. And that wraps up the uh, the first section, which was market research. And again, a special thanks to all of our sponsors who make uh, the event possible. Uh, and now we're gonna move on to the second section, which is marketing. 
Uh, and first up, we've got uh, Luann Grossman, who is, has taken herself off the of mute. Thank you so much. Luann, uh, great to have you with us today. I know your time is short. So I'm going to uh, hop over here to your five best practices and give you the floor. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Hello, everybody. Uh, very happy to be here today on this Friday afternoon talking about government marketing, which is my all-time favorite subject. So let's jump into what I believe are the best five practices that you can do in your government marketing efforts. The first is really ensuring that you have an integrated marketing plan. This means that you're not just doing what I call a one hit wonder, just not doing a particular event, but you're doing a multitude of events that all tie together. But more importantly, that you are working in co-marketing. These could be with partners, they could be with OEMs that have uh, similarities with you so that you're all saying the same message, very important. It's also really uh, important to have a cohesive search engine optimization strategy. Government buyers are searching the internet long before we even know that they are in the process of starting to look at our technology. So make sure that on your website, you've got keywords that are tagged. Talk to your web team about that so that when someone is coming in from government or even partners that are looking to partner with you, if they're typing in a particular topic that you're an expert on, we want you to be ranked at the very high level um, at all the Google search engines and being and things like that. Next is really important, try really hard to execute the majority of your federal marketing plans in the first six months of the calendar year. So this means between January and June. This is needed so that you can affect, help your sales teams and business development teams affect in the buying season. Once you hit that June timeframe, um, it really pretty weak and trying to really get that information across so that you can affect the buying season purposes. So I would recommend that you do that as well as making sure you've got your 2022 planning done way in advance because a lot of the vendors that you're going to be working with to drive strong lead generation and, and build those databases that we need, they fill up very quickly uh, because of that. So make sure that you're getting your plan, putting out January through, through June, but also planning your next fiscal year because you're going to not um, have the availability of those vendors uh, programs that they offer if not. Content, you know, we talk forever, content is king, we all know that. But it's really important to keep those white papers shorter than ever. Uh, put as many graphics as you can in them now. Um, somebody mentioned earlier on the webinar today for capability statements. Marketers need to get involved in, in your company's capability statements. Very important that it's got, again, same point of voice that you want to get across. Also, keep them updated with dates. If it is a little out of date, but the content is still relevant, simply change the date on the web. Um, on the actual document. I see so often it might say 2017 when it's actually still current and you can just switch it up to 2021. So those are some tricks that you can do. Also make sure that your company website, and this is primarily for those companies that do more than just government, but make sure that if you do have a corporate office that you've got very clear visibility on your website that you do sell to the federal government. I had uh, some chief procurement officers on our, our radio program at Federal News Network recently, and they all said that, you know, when it gets to be crunch time and they're having to go to a website to look for contract numbers and they're not there, it's frustrating to them, or they need to confirm that you really do business in the federal government, and if they can't easily find or cannot find at all, um, federal business. The gentleman talking about this from Department of Homeland Security kind of took a piece of paper and threw it behind his back and said, we don't have time, we, we toss it, we go to the next vendor. So that's my last uh, my last point for you. Great, thank you so much. And uh, as far as a quick question over to you, what's the number one suggestion you always give to companies that want to market and sell to the federal government? Well, I'm singing from the same hymn book from Nicole. She mentioned the strategic plans. Every single government agency has to publish a strategic plan. You can download these from their websites. And I, I preach all the time to marketers, please read those because it's pretty much building out your marketing plan, not to your company's products and solutions and services. So get to know intimately the agency strategic plan. It tells you a roadmap of where they're going. Super, thank you. Great points. And thanks for kicking off the uh, marketing section here for us. Uh, appreciate uh, your time today, Luann. Thank you. All righty. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks. Next up, we've got uh, Mark Ampower, a well-known name in government contracting. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Always a have... pleasure. Thanks. And I'm going to hop over here to your five best practices. All yours. All right. Thank you so much. Um, 
So start by selling and marketing where you're already known before you try to expand. If you have an account, if you have a beachhead at a particular agency, it's always going to be easier to sell where you're known. So you can find key influencers on LinkedIn by their agency or their office. Follow them, connect with them. Develop relationships and grow your knowledge base about that client. There are tons of places you can do research. Uh, Nicole mentioned them. Luann just talked about the OMB 53s. Um, if they have a company page on LinkedIn, follow it. In all likelihood, they do because I've identified more than 300 uh, federal offices, cabinet departments, uh, operating divisions and smaller entities within agencies, over 300 that have company pages. But done well, ABM is a very proven uh, successful strategy for growth, especially for smaller contractors. Point two would be differentiate by your area of expertise. If you're a generalist, you're probably going to be treading water for a long time. So clearly enunciate your area or areas of expertise and document these on your website and your LinkedIn profiles. Smaller contractors should have no more than three, preferably one or two major area of expertise. And again, highlight your, your experience here so people start giving you a little bit of credibility. We support this with content, and Luann touched on content, but you, you really need a content calendar so you're driven to post regularly. The content needs to be germane to your target audience and germane to your area of expertise. So once you have an initial piece of content, you can repurpose that into multiple formats. So a white paper can become a webinar, can also become a LinkedIn post or an article. Uh, but do this because different people like different types of content. Not everybody is tactile. Some people want to listen, some people want to watch. But all content ultimately should be resident on your website, but shared via email, social, and however else you're reaching out. Social selling is something that I've been preaching for a while. I was actually preaching it before it had a name, uh, but it's an adjunct activity to traditional sales and business development. It is not a replacement. Social selling tactics include things like commenting on posts, acknowledging promotions, new jobs, birthdays, pretty much any soft touch you can make to someone in your network to remind them that you're there and to keep you top of mind. <clears throat> Pardon me. It also includes your content sharing activities, which should be, you know, somewhat regular. So your LinkedIn profiles need to be optimized because if you start posting content and somebody comes back to see who's posting it, if there's nothing there that's really in detail about your company or your area of expertise, your credibility starts dropping. But it's social selling is engaging with your network in a series of soft touches and touch in a way that can invite a response. Um, so I often take my, my social selling and create uh, uh, follow up zoom calls. This is a great way to get to know people better. Make time to <clears throat> pardon me. Make time to brainstorm with your peers on a regular basis. Uh, they, these can be people in your company, other outside experts similar to, to what you do, uh, either consultants or people with similar position in other companies. But <clears throat> when you have a collaborative environment like a brainstorm session, more ideas are going to occur. So I have <clears throat> two 30-minute standard brainstorm sessions every week through Government Marketing University. Chris Parente, Janet Waring, and I head the ideation group, and we meet Tuesday and Friday mornings at 9 for 30 minutes. And I very much look forward to these. So those are my five tips. Awesome. And uh, great points, as always. Uh, also, why would you emphasize, or why do you emphasize LinkedIn so much? Well, first of all, the market is here. Uh, it's the most underutilized marketing tool available in GovCon. There's 2.1 million feds that I can identify on LinkedIn with every federal agency.
president. I mentioned already that I've identified more than 300 company pages for federal agencies, operating divisions, and smaller activities. So you're able to identify key personnel literally wherever you need to. And most of what you can do here, you can do much, most of what you need to do here, you can do for free. You don't need Sales Navigator. You don't need to pay for a membership. There's a lot of things that you can do on LinkedIn that will help you grow your business. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. Always appreciate your time. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Carol Bernard uh, from Gabology is uh, with us as well. Carol, thank you so much for joining us and uh, love to hear next about your best practices for marketing. Hey, thank you for having me and, and happy new year to everyone. Uh, some, some great information and some great tips put out so far. Uh, so let me just jump right in. Uh, first of all, I want to say getting the facts. I know that this goes back to the market research, uh, but I think that this is so important for people to be able to understand a lot of things that they need to do uh, that's also unique and relevant to their journey because every contractor is going to have a little bit of a different journey depending upon what they sell and who they want to sell it to. We hear kind of in the term marketing location, location, location. One of the facts I think it's really critically important to know is like, where are your customers buying? So, you know, are they going through the schedules? Are they going out through SAM? Are they, you know, going out through the SBA, you know, uh, database to request a quote? You know, are they shopping on Amazon? These are really good things to know, which leads me to my second point, which is also to know your MVPs. My good friend and also a fellow Gavology faculty member, Ms. Judy Bratt, talks about knowing the players at the layers. And I think one mistake that a lot of people make is that they're only trying to reach out and talk to the contracting people, uh, contracting officers. I used to be a contracting officer myself, uh, but also they're like reaching out to a lot of the Ozaboos. Those are great people to talk with, but also Mark Amtower just mentioned getting to know the influencers. and I wholeheartedly support that and say hey and this is what I'm talking about here as well is just know how to go beyond the buyers and e even beyond Ozdaboos to connect with people that are the influencers and maybe those are the program managers maybe they're director of HR what's their title right so these are the people that will be able to generate the requirements nothing gets purchased inside of the government until a requirement is generated and the contracting people just become the processors of those requirements but those are usually generated at the department levels either by the department head program manager or maybe even the end user so knowing your mvps the players at the layers right like judy says and being able to have great questions to ask them on where they're buying will help you position your product and do the right thing for marketing and sales. You know, continuously build your value and your product and your service. You know, this is a, an ever evolving area. So as you start to have conversations with folks inside of uh, the government and you start to see, you know, where your product adds value or maybe where it doesn't in, in relative to your competitors or what the government's already buying, you can take that feedback back into your company and say, hey, where can we build more value in and just continuously evolve because ultimately the government wants best value. Number four, ensure your products or services are properly positioned in front of your MVPs. That's uh, going back talking about that location, location, location. Again, where does the actually government buy? You know, too many people only rely on SAM.gov, right? You kind of set the search agents and you watch and you watch and there's no relevant opportunities. But there's a lot of things that happen outside of SAM. Again, there's, you know, micro purchases that happen in all kinds of different areas. And a lot of these things people don't even see because they happen outside of SAM. So look beyond SAM. Again, talk with your, your, uh, people inside of the agencies ask where are they purchasing the products or services that you sell um, and then also have a foot in the door offer now earlier you know Candace came in and she mentioned that don't cut your price to get your foot in the door and I agree with that what I'm trying to say here is that have a foot in the door offer so for example if you have a product that sells at fifty thousand dollars or a service that sells at fifty thousand dollars can you come in and offer something at five thousand so that when you start having conversations with the right people, 
maybe that turns into an easy buy. They don't have to compete it. They don't have to go through contracting. They just say, hey, let's give it a try. And a lot of times the government likes to try it before they buy it at a higher level with you. So this is a really great time to get your foot in the door, build a relationship, perform well, and then be poised for bigger and better things. So that are those are my five best practices. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carol. And uh, how should a contractor get the facts they need to properly market and sell their products and services to government agencies? Well, a lot has already been said about the market research, right, inside of the, the data mining uh, and, and USA spending has already been mentioned. I want to go back to one thing that is not talked about a lot, which is the qualitative market research. So you got quantitative and qualitative, quantitative being like crunching the numbers. That's really important. And I think it should be done, like Eileen said, before you go in to ask your questions. But the gaps in what you're going to get from that data and the questions that you're going to develop is going to be really great questions to ask when you're talking to people. So this is the thing, again, going back to that, knowing the influencers and being able to ask the right questions of them is going to really help you out to get those remaining facts that's going to maybe fill in the gaps that some of the data doesn't always give you. And my last piece is I'll leave you with is just like really, I believe if you really want more opportunities in 2022, have more conversations with the right people. That's it for me. Great advice. Thank you so much, Carol. It's great to have you on our program today. Thank you for the invite. Okay, thanks. Uh, next up that rounds out this session, we've got Chris Brinker from Ocean 5 Strategies. They are also one of our sponsors today. Chris, uh, great to have you with us today. Excited to hear your pieces here on uh, five best practices for marketing to the federal government. Hey, great, thanks uh, for having me, Jennifer. Um, so uh, just the background, Ocean 5, we create marketing strategies and campaigns and programs for government contractors. Um, and our team has seen that, that focusing on the following practices leads to um, both increased win rate um, and, and business growth for our clients. So um, really the most important starting point is start with a plan. Um, all of your marketing activities should be measurable and tie back to your business goals. Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard the phrase, failing to plan is planning to fail. We do, we do live by that. Um, so, you know, in order to succeed, you really need to have a plan in place with a list of goals, objectives, and what you're going to measure. Um, you, you need to know the right things uh, to measure to make sure that your marketing dollars are giving you return on investment. We really have seen too many people that spend too much time um, measuring the wrong things. Um, secondly, the second point is um, use content and search engine optimization to attract, educate, and build trust and relationships with government decision makers. You've heard from from all three previous uh, marketing experts, you know, we're all hammering on search engines and content and websites. Um, and more and more government decision makers are using contractor websites and search engines to find, to research and validate potential contractors um, and solutions. Remember these decision makers are people and people use the internet to do research. We also, uh, Judy Bratz, a friend of ours too, and. I love quoting her. Um, she likes to say, there is no such thing as doing business with the federal government. You do business with people, with needs, fears, and priorities not found in a database. So remembering that. Um, and then number three, website content. Have all the basic information government decision makers expect to find and quickly. Government decision makers and influences are busy. Don't make them work. Uh, if they can't find what they need quickly, they will move on. We've actually created a checklist of the critical information government contractors um, should have on their website, as well as some common issues that can be working against them. And we're happy to share this list if, if anybody wants to reach out. Um, and then that leads us to the fourth point um, about your website user experience. And that is to make sure that you're building a website that loads quickly and is easy to navigate. You, again, you don't wanna make your visitors work. 
Um, and then building, you know, building that website that loads quickly, it also helps complement your search engine optimization. Slow websites are, are one of the key factors that, um, that Google looks at when actually rating and ranking your website. And then uh, take a really hard look at your messaging and you really need to get the messaging right. Um, you know, what is your differentiator? What problems do you solve? And messaging is not to be confused with content. And a lot of people get, get the two kind of intermingled and confused. Um, messaging is really, it's the core information that you want to share with your government decision makers. Um, it's really it's the foundation for your brand and it should be incorporated into your content. So the content is the various forms of information on your website. It could be a white paper, a, a downloadable, you know, these, these different resources. Um, your decision makers are consuming content online, so make sure you, that you've got the information that they came looking for, uh, like white papers, blog articles, uh, exact, ex, et cetera. Um, so those are my five. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, great tips that you had there. And would you say, are government decision makers really using my website and search engines to make buying decisions? Uh, absolutely. Um, websites have really evolved from just being an online brochure, uh, really into the primary source of information about your company, its experience, the executive team, partnerships, products, past performance, services. Um, government buyers, you know, they have that list of things that they're expecting to see. And then a couple of statistics that we love, um, according to government research experts, 82% uh, of federal decision makers rated search engine and contractor websites as their top rated uh, sources for research. And 73% um, of those will actually download and share online content with colleagues and supervisors. Um, so keeping in mind that you know, your website really can be your number one marketing asset um, you know, speaking for you when you can't and, uh, and make sure that it's communicating your brand and, uh, and is the central hub really for your digital marketing program. Super. Those are great uh, statistics. I'm sure people will uh, take action based on those numbers, hopefully, to uh, clean up their websites. So thanks, Chris. Um, great to have you on the program. Great. Thank you. All right. And again, we want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, who have made today's presentation uh, possible. And next up, we're gonna cover sales and capture. Actually, we've got three of our sponsors uh, from this group. So let's go ahead and get started in the sales and capture section. Uh, first up is Anissa Miller from Bit Solutions. Again, they are one of our sponsors. Anissa, it's great to have you here with us. Just wanna make sure you're not on mute or anything. No, nope, you're good to go. So uh, let me just pull up your five best practices here. Thanks, Jennifer, and happy Friday to all of you. Nice to meet you virtually. Um, as Jennifer said, I am Anissa Milner. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing at Capture Exec Software, which is powered by Bit Solutions. A little bit about me, I have 20 plus years working with the federal government and government contractors. I'm located in the heart of the DMV, headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland, where I live with my 17-year-old son. So nice to meet all of you. So here at Capture Exact, we have put together five best practices for the capture management process and sales process. And our goal is to help enable companies to establish the best repeatable process to help your business grow. So number one best practice is meet with those who know. So what do we mean by that, right? We wanna meet with the right people at the right time. We as sellers get extremely excited when we book a meeting. Trust me, I have been there myself. But you wanna make sure that you're booking meetings with the right people that are going to influence the opportunities that come out. Some examples of that could be a commanding officer, contracting officers, program managers, small business advocates. You want to make sure that you're starting to develop early these relationships with these key individuals and becoming their trusted advisors. Secondly, timing is everything. 
So you want to make sure that you're asking the right questions at the right time. You want to make sure that you go into these meetings prepared with deal shaping questions and that will help you shape the deal in the best possible light for your company. Know what you're going to ask before the meeting happens. Plan and prepare so that you can get the most value out of this meeting and bring the most value to your customers. We don't want to waste anyone's time. Your time is valuable and the customer's time is valuable as well. Third, we want to stay organized, right? So we've collected all this G2 or information that we're going to bring back to our executives and our proposal team. We really want to make sure that we have a central source of memory for all of this information. You need a really good capture management system to help you do that. You need to prepare for your gate reviews, gather intel for the proposal response, and make sure that it's all organized, not on sticky pads or in notebooks or Excel spreadsheets, but a central source of truth. Fourth, you want to build a winning team. You want to have the best team possible working together on these responses. You want to find companies that the government wants to work with and likes. You want to find companies that are experts at different parts of the delivery. You want to utilize a system that stores that information so the different teaming partners that you've worked with in the past, notes on that experience, maybe feedback from other team members within your organization internally, and ratings for those different team members so that you're not having to reinvent the wheel each time when looking for a teaming partner. Fifth and finally, you want to deliver a compelling response. So know information about the customer that other companies do not know. So here you're going to want to utilize best practice one, meet with those who know, right, the right influencers, and two, timing is everything. Make sure that you're meeting with them early on to develop that relationship, to become their trusted advisor, and to hopefully help them shape the solicitation. Have all that information ready for your writers to write that compelling response. Develop proposal team themes ahead of time for your proposal team. So those are our best practices, and I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to share those with you today. Great points, Anissa. Thanks so much for uh, sharing your time with us. And how do you create a capture management process that helps your business scale? Right. Great question. Thanks, Jennifer. As you all know by now, I represent Capture Exec Software. And so when you're using our software, all of the things above are possible. So you're meeting with those who know. You're able to document and keep track of that information in one centralized location. Timing is everything, right? You want to ask those right questions at the right time. You want to make sure you have those deal shaping questions easily available to you. You want to make sure that your team can collaborate internally from the proper contacts to the proper intel on the opportunity to the proposal teams, themes that you'll pass to your proposal teams. Um, some of our customer benefits have been that this really brings people together. It's helped build a repeatable, successful capture management or sales process that we utilize time and time again. So that's how you would develop a capture management process that would help your business scale. Great. Thanks so much, Anissa, and thanks to you guys for sponsoring as well. You've got Anissa's contact information there, and thanks again to Bit Solutions. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks. Okay, next up, uh, we've got Whitney Stoll over at uh, Cribworks. Whitney, I said you're on the line, so thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to move over to your best practices and give you the floor. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and happy Friday, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Just a quick background on uh, Cribworks. We're a sales and business development consulting and advisory firm. And uh, I really appreciate Jennifer providing this opportunity for us. So let's dive right in. Uh, really want to look at this from a sales and business development and capture perspective. So pivot or perish. Uh, what do I really mean by that? And what I'm looking at is what did, you know, what did you and your organization really learn from 20 2020 and 2021, and how can you apply that going into 2022? 
have you really adapted to the needs of your clients, you know, looking at contracts to customer engagement, as well as your sales and captures? You know, a lot of things have changed uh, over this time. You know, how you're actually communicating and talking with your customer. You know, a lot of opportunities have been pushed, uh, you know, really uh, maybe into this year. You know, look at how your customer is buying, what contracting vehicles, you know, you're going to be using. You know, how have your rates been affected? You know, have, have you been working at home? Are you actually going to be in the office? Have you really dug into that on what is happening? You can't, just because of what's worked, you know, in the past might not carry into the future. And with your sales team, even your capture team, you can't just be pushing the close date of your opportunity in your CRM further out, uh, you actually need to be doing your due diligence because when the customer does want to buy, be like, all right, now the opportunity is approaching. You got to make sure you do your due diligence so you can plan to play with the opportunity. And you don't want to perish. You don't want to crumble. You got to be ready to pivot on the opportunities. Uh, next one is hyper alignment with marketing. And Chris Brinker did a great job touching on this, is when you pitch and, t and sell to your client, what you're doing needs to be aligned on your website and your social media, even before you're going to meet with your, your existing client or even a new client. You know, align your meetings, your offerings, even your past performance, but have high quality image, uh, images and videos that can really drive uh, your sales and captures. And I think this is really critical because if you meet with a customer and you have a great meeting, they're going to go to Google, they're going to go to your website to make sure that you actually have that service or that product offering. If you don't, you know, you want to have that relationship going to be able to grow. You know, Google is also your friend, but it's also your enemy. So you can improve your SEO, improve, improve your website, improve what you do, you do on um, online and your social media presence. Your website is also your friend and your enemy as well. You know, you need to treat them well to really be able to drive your performance and drive your sales. You know, so that's a very easy fix, but really work side by side with marketing, especially now that we're doing a lot of meetings on a virtual type platform. Uh, so moving on, having an effective small business uh, subcontracting plan. You know, the Biden administration now uh, moving forward is looking to do a lot more business uh, with, uh, with small businesses. So make sure, sure you actually have an effective uh, plan to reach out and build partnerships. You know, have a targeted list of prime contractors and agencies you want to reach out to. Uh, do your due diligence on who you actually want to uh, be working with. But also internally, you know, what past performance would be relevant to agencies and prim prime contractors that you want to be, uh, want to be uh, targeting? What are your clear value statements? and your differentiators that a company would want, an agency or a prime contractor would actually want to work with you, you know, and promote your core products and your offerings. So not only do you provide value, but you can actually see why people would want to come and work with you. So I think having a small business plan would be very essential for you to be moving forward. Uh, next thing going on is to empower your sales and, and capture team is really to encourage your team to be part of multiple networking groups, nonprofit boards within your respective agencies. I'm sorry, within your inspected industries, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, this could be if you're in the marketing, find some marketing uh, uh, boards to be a part of. Your sales team, if you're in infrastructure or if you're in the Army or the Marines or the Navy, find boards to be a part of so you can really drive authentic relationships. Your companies might be a part of certain trade associations, but encourage your team to be a part of them as well so you can really start to grow uh, leads uh, through there as well. I think that's a great way that I've found that you've been able to really be able to build sales opportunities, uh, teaming agreements as well. Uh, and lastly, uh, I look at uh, teams with support structures uh, really win. And to financially support your sales leaders and your sales team by investing in outside counsel. And outside counsel can have a wide range. You have a lot of experts on this call today covering a variety of different aspects. So don't expect excellence without investing in them with the appropriate resources. You know, create a, a support system that they can actually go out and win opportunities. If you're expecting your sales managers or representatives to do everything from finding the lead to actually writing the proposal, you put a lot of weight on their shoulders. Get an effective team together to be able to help them really drive uh, business. 
you look at sports teams, you know, there's sports teams that actually have effective teams behind them really be able to win. So those are kind of the, uh, the five uh, best practices I look at uh, driving into 2022. Great, uh, great points, Whitney. Thank you so much. And what are a few ways to network and find new opportunities for business this upcoming fiscal year? Sure. Here's a, here's a few areas uh, that I look at. Trade associations, I think, are the great ways to really be able to build uh, relationships. Uh, if you're not part of one, uh, there's plenty if it's either national level or down in the local level. I think being a part of your company should be a part of several, whether it's an 8A, or it's a small business, you know, get a part of several. You can be all cost effective uh, areas that you can uh, definitely join as, as well as you individually. So join different trade associations. Social media, uh, I think, is a different, uh, it's another location you can really uh, find uh, opportunities uh, as well. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, I think you can build off of uh, as well to looking at uh, uh, looking at opportunities. Uh, GSA subnet is another location, as well as looking at you know industry liaisons, small business specialists, and and prime contractors are always looking to, to engage with industry and be able to network and find new opportunities. Awesome. Great job. I appreciate your time and sharing your expertise. Thanks, Whitney. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we've got uh, Alan Scheidt, uh from BidSpeed. And Alan, I believe you're on the line. So I'm going to move over to your best practices and let you kick it off. And we also want to thank you guys for sponsoring our event today. So thank you. Hey, Jennifer. Thanks a lot. Uh, can, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. And um, I, I'm Alan Shives with BidSpeed. And uh, first, I'll say everything that you're hearing today, I was, I was just listening to several uh, speakers before, is spot on. So there's a lot of great information here. So uh, absorb this uh, and and put it to, to practice uh, uh, here. So not just these aren't just, you know, best practices from folks. I know a lot of the folks that are doing this, they've been doing this for a long time. So a lot of good experts. So congratulations, Jennifer, on pulling the, this, this together for everyone. And, and thank you. Um, so so I'll kind of key in on the, the, the practices from a, a logical standpoint uh, as it relates to 2022 to, to, to um, uh, continue on where Whitney left off is, uh, you know, establish the goals. I, I know Chris talked about that. Uh, Anissa talked about that. But you want to... Uh, you know, make sure you know where you want to go uh, in this next year. We're, you know, day one, FY22 uh, here. So spend some time, one and two really go together, reviewing the forecast, understanding what capability it is, it is that you you want to pursue the, the greatest sales of. Where do you want to expand the most at uh, of, from a capability and services standpoint or product standpoint? And where do you want to expand that? And let the data that's out there tell you who's buying that product, who's buying that service. You can do that utilizing uh, agency forecasts uh, that, that are out there. Now, granted, agencies aren't really good at putting forecasts into a single location because by law, they don't. there is no one single location uh, for an agency. There's no SAM.gov for forecasting. There's no uh, federal procurement data system for forecasting. So you, you got to uh, take a look at uh, systems like uh, federal procurement data system and determine, okay, what agencies do I want to pursue uh, and what product do I want to sell? Obviously, you can start at your, your NAICS code or, or some keyword or key phrase to establish that, but establish that goal. Es establish what is your uh, revenue that you want to achieve, uh, and if that revenue is, hey, I want to expand, uh, you know, $100,000 of, of new product sales or new services sales on, on X product or Y product, uh, then go see who's been buying that product and look at their forecast and see what's on their forecast to buy that product. Now, that takes time, right? So, um, but not a lot of time. Uh, I'm, I'm, this might, I'm talking about stuff you could do with three cups of coffee and a and an extended morning here. Um, um, and there's several folks have mentioned, you know, having systems in place to help you, right? There's a lot of .gov sites out there, but there's a lot of good systems out there uh, that uh, can can help pull all this information together for you and make it easy as, as well. Uh, three, four, and five really kind of uh, are repetitive. Uh, three really kind of is the break line here, preparing your response packages ahead of time. 
if you went and looked at 100 sources sought and 100 RFPs, and you compared those across the board, you would find that sources sought and RFIs, that out of those 100, 85 to 90% of the information that is being asked of you to respond with is always there. Uh, so prepare a, or standardize your own response package ahead of time, right? So you that gets you 85% uh, down the road in responding. And then you can look at a case by case and see, okay, is the government asking for a unique question here that I should respond with? Uh, the same with RFP templates. If you looked at, at RFPs, same thing. If you compared 100 RFPs or RFQs, uh, you know, the guiding FARs such as, you know, 52212-1, you're going to see that probably 60 to 80% of the time. You know, that's a wide gap, but that's the, the, the prevalent FAR for establishing a compliant response package, right? And there's a lot you can do ahead of time to prep that. So versus waiting until the opportunity comes out and then trying to do it, you, you, you're able to focus on the opportunity itself versus administratively getting yourself ready and there's a lot of uh, uh, folks and companies out there that can help you in preparing these packages and, and building a what i'll call a gold standard package a, ahead of time that that maybe you even go as far as to to library your content so if you're providing a service and that service is the same right your your processes don't change then maybe you go ahead and document that from a technical uh, response uh, standpoint, much like an ISO. I'm not talking about like an ISO pro uh, process, uh, but but in similar, right? You can document that process and keep it in a in an RFP template, so you've got it there to use, and you're not having to recreate it every time. Uh, four and five here really go hand in hand. Um, I think everybody uh, today would say they've probably been to a hundred conferences where the federal government stands up and says the best way for you to market your services to the federal government is to respond to source of thoughts and RFIs uh, there. That's the government basically screaming and a megaphone saying, hey, we need to know who can do this work um, out there. And the, the one mistake I think small businesses make especially is they go, well, I don't have time to respond to that because there's really no revenue attached to it and the RFP may be six months away. So I'll just wait for the RFP to come out. Well, once you make that decision to wait for the RFP come out, you automatically start putting yourself uh, in a defensive position because now you don't have influence over that acquisition. And by by law, uh, in an eight to nothing ruling in the Supreme Court, I think it was 2018, you know, agencies cannot unilaterally say we've met our small business goals. So we don't have to look at source of thoughts from a small business. Right. We can pick who we want. Uh, if they get two eight A's or they get two um, economically disadvantaged women on small business or two hub zone or two SD BOSBs, uh, then then they have to, by law, consider that uh, as a part of their acquisition strategy moving forward. So that is your best time to market your services and capability uh, to the federal government. Right. Um, and I'll come back to federal government here in just a second in the question. But then follow up. Um, the second biggest mistake is follow up, follow up, follow up. Um, companies, for whatever reason, um, and individuals are, there's a fear of calling that contracting officer or looking, there's an appearance problem, right? Of saying, well, I don't want to bug them too much because they may, they may set me aside and not come back to me. That's absolutely false, right? So, um, they're, they're essentially, that's their job, right? To receive any questions that you need and they're the quarterback internally in their organization to help manage that procurement. Uh, and so they're there, um, you know, catching the information as it comes to them. So if you've got questions or you need to know a status of something, follow up. The worst thing that can happen to you is you have to leave a voicemail or you get no response from a, a contracting officer or they're not going to put you on some list that says, oh, I don't, this person uh, really uh, follows up too much uh, there. Obviously, they would really love to have a contractor that shows up and does the work and does follow up versus not. So don't be afraid to follow up there. So establish your goals, let the forecast and let the data tell you where to go. Um, who to go to, what capabilities to sell, um, do some preparation up front uh, and getting ready for FY22 as it relates to your response packages. 
um, meaning, you know, set some time aside, get all the administrative stuff, clean up your cover letters, get everything ready to go minus content uh, there. And then uh, dig your heels in and start responding. Um, you, you know, if you do not uh, get in the game and take a shot, you will never score uh, a, a basket or a goal or, a, you know, to, to use a, another sports analogy. You got to get in. You got to participate in order to uh, to get a contract coming back your way or the opportunity for a contract uh, coming your way. So and then follow up uh, there, Jennifer. So I'm ready for the question. All right. Thank you so much. So. Uh... Uh, Alan, what is the most challenging part of doing business with the government and what can you re recommend to our audience to move the sales needle in the positive direction? Yeah, so um, so the, the challenging part there, having been through that myself, so coming from the Air Force, going to large business, figuring out how to do it, starting my own business, eventually selling that business, right? Um, I, I, I grew up in the, you know, from the Air Force side, right? So I, you know, when you, the, the biggest, for somebody that hasn't been in government or has it come you know, uh, came from the, the service or something, sometimes the, the term government can be intimidating, right? There's sort of that fear of the, the large size that there is. And I, I can't do something or I can't call somebody because, uh, you know, I, I might get in trouble or I might look bad or, or something. That, there, and I, I believe it was uh, Chris uh, Brinker that, that said, these are people trying to do a job. They're just on a different side of the fence. So they need you to follow up, uh, to respond as bad as you want to respond uh, there. So, you know, eliminate that fear, you know, take government, don't view it as government, view it as, hey, I've, I've got a potential client at the Department of State and their name is Jane or their name is uh, John and, and I need to uh, coordinate with them on uh, this opportunity or this forecast. Uh, view them as a, a person, view them as a company, view the State Department as a company and that's a division of the company that they're working with. So, um, so overcome that fear of of government and then just get in the game and and uh and start uh and do everything that ever, everybody is saying here today um is spot on Super. Right thank you so, so much um, i wish thank you thank you and uh, good luck to everybody this uh, fiscal year thank you uh last up in this section uh is another sponsor david al from our friends over at the federal business council david thank you so much for joining us we've got your contact hi jennifer hey, how's my sound can you hear me Yep, perfect. You are good to go. Thank you for Great. joining us. Thank you for being a sponsor. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you here for your best practices. Great. Thanks. And um, I, I took a look at who was here today. And I know a lot of people personally that are here in the audience. And um, I think many of you have also experienced our uh, some of our events or many of our events. And I'm here to talk today about the power of government events as a marketing channel and to develop uh, new leads and message and brand awareness. And a lot of the speakers today uh, mentioned getting to know the right people, connecting, asking questions, and uh, really understanding who's who. And somebody mentioned the, the players at the layers and things like that. Events provide a, a, an extreme opportunity to uh, make that happen, especially in the government marketplace. Uh, they're affinity-based. Uh, meaning that uh, you you know you have something in common with the attendees and the attendees are there for a reason and you being there as a part of that connects you by affinity uh, events are also permission based so from a marketing point of view instead of an interruption style uh, marketing events create an implied permission for you to connect with the attendee in the context of the event so it, pro it provides an entree or a, a door opener if you will and um, also provides relevance to your company, your message, and builds credibility, especially if you're using the event as a thought leadership tool. So a couple of different best practices that we've um, discovered, and I'm gonna go a little bit off script here. Uh, the first one is leverage the trends. Uh, the trend being, the primary trend being, events have had to shift and pivot, to use um, uh, someone else's word there, to a virtual format over the past, 18 months and many of you have probably participated in virtual events this session that we're on today is a virtual event uh, why have we gone in that direction well by necessity number one and um, uh, virtual events though offer a number of different things that 
in-person events don't offer or don't offer as well. So there are some trade-offs. And when I, when I talk about the trends, um, you know, 84% to, to use another statistic of executives believe that events are critical to company success, especially marketing events. And that really hasn't changed during the COVID era. Uh, what has changed is the way that that gets done. Uh, so the second best practice is reset your expectations. When we first started doing uh, virtual events and shifting from live events, uh, the expectation was that we would duplicate the in-person experience uh, in a virtual format. And I think all of us very quickly found out that that was a difficult challenge, if not impossible. And we had to understand what a virtual event is and how it how it worked for uh, the purpose of lead generation, lead nurturing, thought leadership, creating relationships, getting people to connect and find one another and find the right people um, in the context of their message. So how did we make that happen? Uh, the best practice was you know, really helping reset expectations for not only our customers on the government side and on the industry side, but also with ourselves, what in, in understanding what an event is uh, today. And moving forward, what a hybrid event will be going forward. So that more on that later. Um, the other few best practices that I've got are more practical and things that we've learned by doing virtual events for the past 20 months. Um, one is, uh, and we see this all the time, think about your the background. If you're gonna be on video, if you're presenting, if you're running a virtual booth, does your background represent you? Is your lighting correct? Um, you know, what does your space look like? Uh, we've moved beyond functional uh, the camera, being on camera to having uh, more of a stage, more of a setup. So make sure that that's working and that that also lends a lot of credibility to your message. Uh, the other one, and this may sound simple, but it, it, it was a uh, uh, something that we discovered and started to teach our participants, use multiple browser wins windows when you're in a virtual event. Um, and if you right click on any of the parts of a virtual event, you'll open up that section in a, se a separate window. And that way you can keep all the things that are going on at one time up and on screen instead of shifting between uh, different segments of the same event and having to lose or lose visibility. Um, and for exhibitors, if you are participating in virtual events, um, leave your session open all day. As uh, you know, people come through the event and uh, attendees are looking for things that support the reason that they're there, they will find you um, eventually. And when they do, you want to make sure that your material is there um, and understand that it's a different type of booth than you would have if you were at a live event or a face-to-face -face event. But uh, it's still just as important to have it set up the right way to answer the question that customers have. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, why are events a powerful tool? And events in the government especially are a powerful tool because the because events are important to the government itself. Um, it's one of the primary ways that they share information. It's one of the primary ways that they engage with one another and also find um, uh, new companies and new ideas to help them do their jobs. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jennifer. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Those are great points. And uh, I'm a true believer in events, as you know. Uh, how has the transition to virtual events allowed FBC to help connect to industry and government during the past two years of COVID times? Yeah, I touched on a couple of points and I maybe answered a few things in my earlier points. But I will say that, uh, like I said, early on, it was I think we were all scrambling to find a way to just con continue to deliver um, events as a as a marketing tool and as a communication tool. And we quickly learned how to um, drive engagement through digital means, how to help people find one another, how to create communities of interest within an event so that people can find each other not only during the event, but after the event. And so many of the speakers earlier mentioned, you know, the importance of of finding the right people, of creating relationships, of connecting. Um, after you do your research and you find out, you know, this is where I need to do business. And to go back to Mark Amtower's tool, agency-based marketing, virtual events actually help us create agency engagement um, at a very high level. There's higher participation, there's higher, uh, there's longer stay rates, and we have uh, great, great experience and great results from that. But 
pivoting. So it, it took us a while to get to the point where we understood how to make that happen online. But now that, and that was, you know, early on for the past year and a half, it's been full steam ahead and tens of thousands of gov govies are coming to uh, FBC events. And we're working with many, many agencies to produce their internal events to reach out to industry. So there's a great connection point and the pivot has been successful. Now, as we move into hybrid, you know, we'll see how that works and we have some plans for that, but um, that, that's how we've done it. And thanks for having us here today, Jennifer. Great, thanks so much, David. And the best way to reach you is the email uh, for Anthony Greg and Wright, fbcinc.com. Yes, Anthony, just to make sure that we are getting back to everybody immediately, if you send it to Anthony, it'll get to me and um, we'll, I'll get right back to you. Super, and thanks again for sponsoring. Um, great, uh, great points that you made. And that rounds out our sales and capture uh, session. Again, we wanna thank all of our sponsors. Um, who have made the webinar today possible. And now we're gonna move on to proposal writing. I realize we're a little behind schedule and time, uh, but we've got a great group here for proposal writing. Uh, dear friend and um, longtime colleague, Jim Bender is here with us from ZK Development. Uh, Jim, I'm just gonna move over to your slide here and uh, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Jennifer, for including me today. Happy New Year to everyone, I trust. You had a good uh, FY21, and you're really going to get ready to jump on it in 22. I'm going to talk about some some things I've learned over my 25 years in federal contracting about best practices and proposal writing. And the first thing I'm going to say is the best way to up your win rate on proposals is to make sure you're only bidding on the best opportunities. Well, there are dozens of RFPs that are going to cross your inbox over the course of this fiscal year that you're capable of bidding on. Every firm has limited resources to mount capture and proposal efforts. Your company has to figure out how to gather intel on upcoming ops. So when the RFP drops, you are making decisions based on data and not hunches. Where are you gonna get this data? Of course, there's FBDS, GovWin, USA Spending, and the other packages on buying patterns. There's agency public domain information share public to, uh, shared in congressional authorization documents, public meetings uh, with feds, and information gathered by your employees and team members who have client contact. Have a process in place for making these decisions quickly with all relevant stakeholders when the proposal period starts so you don't waste precious time dithering over the go-no-go -no -go decision. Next, it's tempting to rush from RFP to writing to allow more time for writing. Best practices based on years of experience writing proposals says you should spend 15 to 20% of the proposal opening time on the front end planning your response. So if it's a 28 day window, that's four or five calendar days, which seems like a lot, but it's gonna pay off. This is when your prop manager and your leadership team should be setting your win themes based on the data you have from the client and on the competition. Don't leave it to the writers to figure this stuff out, but the people who have the knowledge in their hand and are best positioned to make these decisions, to so spend time organizing this information and thinking about the best way to win this thing and how to communicate your superiority to the evaluation team reading your response. Then this information has to be communicated to the writing team in a way that makes sure they really understand the win strategy. They should, this kickoff meeting that you're going to have, uh, they should be encouraged to ask questions so they understand how their piece of the proposal fits in with all of the others and the win strategy. This may take two hours, it may take four, but everyone should be present at the meeting because a decision made on how to write task one may not only imp impact how to write the management plan, but also the budget and how we describe bid staff. Everybody needs to be there everybody needs to be talking. A good proposal manager should have a sense about whether uh, the writing team really gets the strategy in their assignment. If they are silent during the kickoff, this may be a sign that they need some one-on-one -on -one follow-up to make sure they're clear on what's what. Um, so uh, number four, uh, you want to make sure your proposal manager is helpful and available. Uh, in order to get to the holy grail of the proposal manager's life, that is a first draft that works, 
you have to you have to make sure that everybody is um, open to asking questions. The most troubling sign from a team member on a proposal team is silence and missed deadlines. This means that the writer is either not started working or, or they are maybe over their head and afraid that someone will figure that out and punish them for it. A good proposal manager needs to be available at all hours because people generally have day jobs and they're gonna work late into the night and they need to be open to dumb questions and helpful and to be able to provide the resources to get uh, people who, who are wandering in the wilderness back on track. Don't just uh, call up a writer and ask them, how's it going? But get really de uh, detailed into asking them specifics about the challenges of their section. Does the quality control process we devise seem to work with our technical solution? How are you doing on page count and so on? Finally, in order to get, uh, you need to have a good process in place for your color team reviews. I've seen so many of these color team reviews where we just open up the line and let anybody talk any which way. You need to have a strategy about how you're going to collect information in an orderly fashion. Perhaps you want to have the outside reviewers are not on the writing team go first and then dismiss them and then have the internal reviewers go through section by section or reviewer by reviewer. There needs to be somebody on the call that's recording what's discussed so that there are decisions on every piece of information that's brought into the call and a process for deciding what to do with it. Uh, those are my five best practices for proposal writing. Back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jim. Uh, great points. And what's the most important factor in a company's proposal win percentage? The most important factor is to be prepared. People put too much emphasis on the process of proposal writing. The process, of the, the win theme on proposal writing is irrelevant. It's the win theme on the whole BD cycle. So you have to be prepared when the RFP drops and have a strategy ahead of time and have your team in place or else your win, strat your win percentage goes way down. Thank you everybody for your time and attention. Great, thanks, Jim. Appreciate your time. Uh, next up, we've got Catherine Bennett, who uh, is just wrapping up the awesome conference put on by Lupio over the last uh, two days. You guys did a great job. It was a lot of fun. Catherine, Thank I think you. I saw you on the panel. It's great to have you with us today. And I'm just going to hop over here to your five best practices. Yes, hi, thank you. This has been an extremely valuable practice so far. I'm so glad we've had a chance to talk about launching into our federal fiscal year with all of these amazing tips. And I would love to add to these from the perspective of efficiency and automation within your proposal space. So a lot of times we think about the content that's extremely important. And of course, we're going to talk about that a little, a little bit too. Um, but I'm a proposal management expert with 12 years of experience in the industry for federal and state and local governments. Um, and I focus heavily on how to be most efficient so that you can spend the time elevating your practice and not dealing with the, with the uh, kind of crummy lower level work, the low value work in our proposal processes. So when I think about proposals for the federal government this year, what I am focusing on heavily is compliance. We think about the three-legged stool and the ways in which proposals are won. And the bottom, the, the foundation, the bottom line for these is that you have to comply with the requirements that are set forth by the government agencies that are promulgating these um, these documents. So making sure that we're complying, getting all the forms, getting all of the requirements and the tables formatted in the appropriate way, or else you're going to just get kicked right out of the process. And we don't want that. Of course, the other two legs of the three-legged stool are compliance, price, and uh, and proving that we can answer the customer's needs. So when we think about proposals, number two here, we want to think about how we're proving value most effectively. When we talk about proposal win rate, it's not heavily dependent on the price in many contexts. What we're trying to achieve is best value. But what does value even mean? We want to think about that ways in which we deliver what the customer needs and we describe how we can best deliver what the customer needs so that the price seems justified. Low price bids are not the most commonly winning 
bids, right? Unless there's a specific government structure that, that justifies that choice. But how are you communicating your value? And again, that's justifying the price and describing the benefit that you're really going to be bringing to your customers. Uh, third, and, and perhaps something that we don't talk a lot about in the federal space, but that is something that's top of mind for me is using tech tools to support your process. And with all due respect to the fact that proposal managers do put a lot of work in, I don't believe that our proposal teams should be working after hours. I think that our proposal managers have just as much of a right to work-life balance as other folks in our organizations. And tech tools are the answer to a lot of those challenges. So when we think about how do we organize our information that we've previously used for other documents. If we use a library like Lupio or some of the other available solutions that are on the market today, we can often improve the efficiency of our processes and actually make sure that the entire team is supported in communicating expectations and making sure that information is really clear. So tech tools not only include proposal automation solutions, but also things like your CRM um, or maybe even sales tools that can help track your calls and analyze the way in which you're doing business. So don't be shy. The, the, the winningest proposal shops out there are heavily entrenched in tech right now. And if you're not on that boat, it's, it's, going, to sh it's going to sail off without you. <laughs> Number four, let's educate our internal stakeholders about expectations before proposals launch. So what we need to do really here is get our managers on board so that subject matter experts and technical teams already have proposal times built into their work. Proposals cannot be done effectively off the side of a desk, and we, they need to be considered as primary revenue generating activities. And so the, again, the best proposal shops are thinking about that before they ever launch into responding to these requests, and they're making making sure that their technical teams have the time, have the bandwidth, and have the training to effectively deliver the content that we need. And number five, now this is one that I'm particularly excited about, is measuring our department and our responses. So Lupio and, again, other solutions on the market today offer methods for measuring your department's progress and your effectiveness that help you troubleshoot your sales process. So if you're measuring at different points along the proposal management cycle, you can identify where you're falling down and how you can respond more effectively. So think about availing yourself of FOIA requests making sure that you're debriefing with your customers effectively so that you can identify the parts of your proposal that really hit the mark and those that may have fallen a little bit short. So we also think about measuring the process of our departments. How are we responding and how are we getting to, you know, to the previous speaker's point, how do we get to that first draft faster and more effectively using the tech tools that we mentioned in that in number three. Um, so these are the top five best practices that I'm really considering over this fiscal year to advance my own proposal practice and to recommend to others in the space. Uh, and I'm ready for questions. All right. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, what are one or what are the best one to two metrics uh, that proposal managers can measure for their departments? Yes. So I am thinking right now of cost per bid. So what I want to do is quantify the amount of time and therefore the dollar value that is going into each proposal. So if you can track for technical folks, just a rough estimate about how much time they're spending, how much money you're spending on materials, and how much time the proposal managers themselves are spending on these documents, you can identify a good cost per bid and determine how effective your proposal management activities are and therefore identify steps for pursuing more efficiency. Now, the second metric that I think is extremely important that a lot of us don't think about, we often consider win rate, but we don't necessarily think about shortlist rate. So if we are having a, a particularly high win rate and a high shortlist rate, then we know that our system is going well. Is But if we have a high shortlist rate and a low win rate, perhaps we're falling down in our interviews. So if we're thinking about cost per bid and shortlist, those are the top two. Now, Lupio did just release a 22 metric guide that's at lupio.com slash RFP dash metrics that you can access at no cost and understand a little bit more about how you can measure your own departments for maximum success. Awesome. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's great to have you with us today and congratulations on wrapping up the uh, Lupio conference this week. Thank you. Great. Next up, we've got uh, Rena Bahita, who has uh, been a speaker for us in the past on uh, proposal writing and other topics. So, Rena, it's great to have you with us today. I'm going to move over to your uh, best practices here and give you the floor. Thank you. And not to put you in an embarrassing situation, my last name is always mispronounced. It's Rina Bhatia. <laughs> so Sorry. Uh, thank you. That's okay. But thank you so much for this opportunity. And it's great to be back on one, uh, another one of your webinars. I've been listening. I jumped in a little bit earlier, uh, heard a lot about the capture uh, sales process and uh, ha happy to have all these peers 
uh, on the proposal side as well. And to, you know, I took a little bit of a different turn here on my slides and the talking points. There's a lot of information on how to uh, improve your proposal writing processes. And I liked what Jim said earlier, prepare, spend a lot of time preparing. Um, what, um, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm mispronouncing your name here, Catherine, what you said earlier, use tech tools, you know, leverage technology to uh, make your proposal process efficient. Um, what I'm going to talk about here, my few pointers are going to raise eyebrows with the proposal managers on the call or the proposal team folks on the call and it's going to make the C-suite very happy because this is a dichotomy that we have. The proposal team keeps saying, no, we got to write, we got to write from scratch. You can't just reuse material. We got to tailor it. And the C-suite who is not necessarily in the process of writing keeps saying, well, we did this on that proposal. Why can't you just reuse it? Go copy and paste it in here. Um, so what I'm going to give you here, my top five best practices, First of all, I want to make it very clear. I do not like proposal libraries. My slides might indicate or say something towards it, but what my pointers are is jumping on what Jim said earlier. Use your time efficiently and prepare. And so these tips are for how you can prepare. Um, identify your proposal, the processes in a proposal section. And I think it was Alan in the sales cycle who said, if you look at 100 RFIs, 100 RFPs, you start to see a repeatable pattern. What does the government typically always ask for? Your, your recruiting plan, your quality control plan. How do you train your employees? These are business processes. Identify those early and come up with a proposal narrative on your business process. Your business processes don't necessarily change. They have to be tailored, but they are not going to completely change based on the RFP you're going to respond to. So identify your business processes and come up with a proposal section for those. Uh, that becomes your reusable content. Uh, and as I said, your, your corporate processes are not gonna change regardless of the nature of the work you do. If you are bidding in your industry, if you're bidding the same type of work, your business processes are gonna be consistent. Assign a process owner. I cannot tell you how many times we walk into an organization, we see their proposal libraries that are hodgepodge of sections that were pulled out of different proposals from 1985 to Lord knows when, none of them are relevant and still uh, their employees are copying and pasting those processes. Every process in your proposal, um, I, I'm going to use the word now and hate it, proposal library in your proposal process stack should have a process owner assigned to it whose responsibility it is to go and look at it at least once a year and update it. Do not have outdated processes in place. Um, and don't, don't start claiming things that you don't do or, hey, this looked great on the internet, reusable content that I just bought off of some website. I'm going to make that my process. If you don't do it, you don't do it. Document what you do and update it once a year. White label your reusable content. Do not submit. We did, you know, we're, we're going to be supporting ARMY when you're writing a FEMA proposal. Make sure your writers catch that or at least you point them to the sections that should be white, uh, should be customized and tailored. So white label your reusable content. And absolutely there is no such thing as a 100% copy and paste. You have to go back in and read what you have just copied and pasted, your own process, and say, does it relate to what the government is asking for? Does it relate to what the customer needs are? And where do I need to tailor it? That part, you bring in your experts. And again, jumping on Catherine's point, by doing all of this, you are going to reduce your cost of building a proposal in the long run. Uh, and so these are my five tips to jump on everything else, not in isolation. Ready for questions. Great, thanks, Rena. And are proposal libraries useful when it comes to writing? And they're not. And I, I <laughs> proposal, I don't like to use the word library at all. Uh, re, the proposal libraries, unless you 
your reusable content stack. We call it reusable content stack. You know, you, you might say it's the same thing. You're just calling it something different. But the idea that you can have this library of uh, reusable content just sitting around doing nothing, no. It, it's your, um, I don't think they're very usable unless you maintain and update them regularly. Super, thank you so much. Those were uh, great points. Sorry for the mispronunciation. And uh, next we're gonna bring up uh, Ann Pine from NXT. Ann, I think I saw you on the line and uh, hopefully you're ready to roll here. So I'm gonna move over to your best practices and give you the floor. And maybe I've got you on mute, I'm sorry, let's see. Uh, Ann, I think you're self-muted. So uh, if you can take yourself off mute, we're, there we go. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for having me, and it's been a pleasure um, listening to everyone so far. It's um, super informative and a great way to kick off the, the new year. So I've put together some of our um, best practices and tips specifically for writing. Um, so the first one is that writers should write. Um, so what I mean by that is while your technical team is a vital component of the proposal effort, that doesn't mean that they have to or should write all of it. Um, because if the greatest solution isn't well articulated, the proposal probably won't make sense to your, to your evaluators. Um, and the most common issue I hear about proposal writing from different clients is that it's too technical and doesn't write easily. So um, using good writers that are experienced in the industry, whether they're your internal employees or external consultants is super important for making sure that your, your proposal will be easily read. Um, next up is passive as wimpy. So this is pretty standard stuff, but is your proposal written in active versus passive voice? So for example, which do you feel is a stronger statement? The solution was designed by John Smith's team, which is passive, or John Smith's team designed the solution, which would be active. So generally you, you'll know if the sentence is active, if it answers who did what. Um, in the active example that I mentioned, who is John Smith's team, what is designed the solution? Um, because people or your readers tend to think in terms of who did what, writing the active voice really is one of the most reader-friendly tactics you can employ in your proposal. Um, next up is capitalization is king. This is pretty self-explanatory, but I feel like we see this a lot too, where random words are capitalized throughout the proposal and it's actually really hard to read. Um, so listen to your English teachers that taught you to capitalize only the proper nouns um, and you'll be doing a great service. Um, so just use the capital letters sparingly and accurately. Um, the fourth, is turn down that buzzing. So what I mean by that is the buzzwords. Um, if you think about it, every solution can't be best of breed, state of the art, and world class. So you wanna employ meaningful adge adjectives to describe your solution or service and the benefits that it can yield. Excessive use of buzzwords seems lazy. Um, so put as much effort into describing your solution or service as you did designing it. You can feel free to email me for a list of some of the most overused buzzwords that we see. Um, there's, there's a lot that I'm sure you are all familiar with. Um, and finally, less is more. Um, we're seeing this more and more where proposals are getting shorter, the page limits are less. Um, and as I've kind of done here with my own slide, um, I think it's much easier for readers to read when there's, there's less content. Um, extraneous words take a valuable space and then nothing to your content. Readers really do appreciate brevity, especially government evaluators. Um, so you don't wanna get trapped into writing three sentences when one would suffice. If you haven't made your point in three sentences, the fourth probably won't help. Um, so you wanna read your proposal, read it again and again, each time looking for ways to make it shorter, more efficient. Um, and don't just be your own editor, bring in other people, whether you're from your company, different folks from different um, areas or even outside consultants can help to make sure that it um, makes sense. Um, so I think those are all of my my tips I have, Jennifer, so I'm ready for a question. Yeah, and I, I love short, succinct slides, so thank you so much for uh, making <laughs> yours that way. Uh, with most proposal writing being completed remotely right now, uh, what's your top tip for successful reviews? 
Um, yeah, so it kind of ties into Catherine's um, points about technology. I think, um, you know, having a single online source for documents and information is, is critical right now. Um, you see it with, with folks emailing back and forth, you really lose version control and also just a security issue. If it's, you know, confidential information, you really don't want to be emailing it back and forth. Um, so using a something like G Suite or Office 365 Box, Dropbox, and they all have free options, which are, are great for, um, you know, smaller companies as well. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. Appreciate your time and love your Thank tips. You. And uh, that rounds out our uh, proposal writing session. And we're going to do another quick shout out and thanks to all of our sponsors who made today's event possible. Again, we've got uh, C3, Bit Solutions, FBC, BitSpeed, Ocean 5, The Boone Group, Government White Papers, Work Plan, Work Plan SWIC Tech, uh, First National Bank, and GovFlex. Okay, and our last session here is on compliance, uh, which is obviously a very important uh, piece of government contracting. Uh, Bill Wooten over at C3, who is one of our sponsors and a newsletter advertiser for us as well. Bill, it's great to have you with us. I'm sure your uh, best practices here are uh, centered around CMMC, so I'm going to give you the floor. Great, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. Great, awesome. So for us as a technology provider, when we talk about compliance, we're really talking about cybersecurity compliance. As anyone who works with the DOD knows, CMMC is very much kind of on the topic and on the mind of everyone. Uh, so this is gonna be framed a little bit around the idea of CMMC and a CMMC program. Uh, number one is, as, as a contractor, you need to think about investing in cybersecurity. Before you get to the point of talking about uh, compliance, you need to recognize that cyber is an important part of your business. Just like benefits are part of payroll and overall compensation, marketing is part of sales and overall business development, cyber is part of your IT and your overall uh, ability to perform and do anything as an organization. So it's really about having the mindset that cybersecurity is here to stay and it needs to be part of your budgeting, your culture, everything you do in your organization. Getting into a little bit around the CMMC place, first things first is, number two here, do your 800-171 self-assessment. If you are doing work with the DOD, if you are expecting to win awards with the DOD, you're gonna be asked for that SPRS score. You're gonna to need to upload it. It is something that needs to be done if you're gonna continue or try to start doing work with the DOD. Also, number three, use the results of that assessment to build your roadmap. Uh, POAM may not be the right word, but you're not going to get a perfect score. No one's expecting a perfect score in that self-assessment at this point with SPRS. Use that exercise to truly and honestly identify your gaps, where you need to improve, and where you need to put work in to gradually improve that score. Fourth, start looking at your subcontractors. Clause 7020, if you're doing work with, the de with, with defense uh, and the DFARS 7020 clause, requires you to go validate your cyber security of your subcontractors. That is as easy as kind of getting their SPRS score today, but more and more we're seeing folks that are prime contractors ask much more than that. Where are you with 800-171A and have and very pointed questions around, have you deployed MFA, conditional access, monitoring, those types of things. We're starting to see that more and more as a trend. And then the final best practices, start somewhere. If you're an organization that has not invested in cyber, you start from a technology approach. Get your technology in place, get your network in place, work on your cybersecurity and lock your environment down. If you've made those investments, then you can probably move forward to some form of a gap assessment, whether that's internal or from a third party to really measure where you stand. Okay, and thank you, uh, Bill. I appreciate those uh, good points on compliance. And as the overall CMMC program seems to be stalled, what should contractors do now? Yeah, and, and I think it's easy to have a perception that the CMMC program is stalled a little bit. In a lot of ways, it has. I think we're going to see that start to shake up um, as we get towards the end of the year. The DOD has signaled that their reviews are going to wrap up by the end of the year. They're, they've left open the fact that there may be some changes, but even if there are some changes, it, don't expect that to deviate far from 800-171. That's already embedded in your DFAR 7012 clause. So most of the work that you can do today, 
we just get you closer and closer to being ready when that compliance audit shows up. We're also starting to see the CMMC AB board approve their learning okay. partner, which means that they will uh, they will start rolling out classes, and that will really accelerate the ecosystem. Uh, so everything that I just said in terms of walking through, starting your assessment, using the results as a roadmap to make improvements, start validating your subs, start asking them the hard questions. Those are all the things you can do now so that as CMMC matures, you're ready and you're just making minor adjustments instead of being caught flat-footed. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys sponsoring the event and uh, always good to have you on our programs and uh, great information on CMMC. So thank you, Bill. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Great. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Heather T, a well-known name in government contracting. Heather, it looks like you are on the line. Uh, so I'm going to move over to your best practices. Great. Um, thank you so much. So now is a great time for everyone to look at your annual compliance refresher training. Not only your ethics, your export control, you know, training around False Claims Act or Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or Truthful Cost or Pricing Act, Procurement Integrity or International Traffic and Arms, but also think about your business systems, such as your estimating and procurement system processes and procedures. You really want to make sure you take some time to help your teams working on proposals, how to make, make sure you've trained them on how to develop a strong basis of estimate and how to effectively justify your rationale for the selection of subcontractors, the materials, the equipment, and other direct costs that you're putting into your proposals and why those prices are reasonable and realistic. Um, it's also a good time to do internal audits of your business systems and refresh your manuals, your processes and procedures, and update um, any of your compliance refresher training. Another thing that's important to do right now is just many of you will be in strategic planning right now. And so um, while, you're, while you're in your strategic planning processes for your next fiscal year, you should also consider compliance. Um, there are a lot of compliance requirements as we've just heard for cyber. Those should definitely be considered. Um, COVID and, and other things particular to your business. How will these impact your organization overall from the cost to the business? indirect time perhaps needed for educating staff. Do you need to establish a center of excellence or do you need some outside assistance? And how will you make sure your employees and subcontractors understand all those kinds of compliance requirements? So that should be something your business is thinking about um, going forward. Don't leave that compliance piece out. Um, another thing to do is um, to actually include compliance criteria as part of your go, no go bid decision. So always use a standard matrix that includes compliance criteria that clearly document your black and white go, no, go, no, go requirements for your bid decision. That way everyone in your organization is clear internally on what those important compliance items are to your organization. Then they can collect the data needed for decision making, seek any approvals that may be needed. And it also allows you to document those decisions and have them um, written down so that you know why you made those particular decisions for that bid. It's also a good um, practice to conduct iterative proposal compliance reviews along a set schedule, especially for those items that may be more difficult, unusual, or complex. Um, in my world of cost and pricing, that's really important. Um, it's very important to set deadlines for these difficult, unusual, complex compliance items so you have appropriate time to address them. You don't want to get to the end of a proposal and have missed something. Um, again, you know, as a cost and price professional, there, there can be some very complex or unusual things. If you're having to create a new cost center, um, make a big change to your organization, you need to do those kinds of things early. And then lastly, Definitely hold yearly reviews of your contracts to ensure understanding of compliance requirements. It's likely along the year that the management staff and internal support personnel have changed. So it's always imperative that you take time to review those contract compliance requirements. For example, if your contract requires everyone to have a security clearance, make sure that everybody understands that so you don't run afoul of your contract. Um, but definitely go over those various co um, compliance requirements for your contract. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. Those are uh, great points, as always, from you. Uh, and question over to you is, why engage a third party for compliance reviews of proposals? Yeah, um, 
you all spend a lot of time and money getting your proposals together and you don't want to lose because you made some kind of error or a subcontractor made an error in your response. A third party can really provide that fresh set of eyes around compliance, especially an external third party. So engaging third parties for reviews, um, a, for example, of your subcontractor sealed cost price proposals or even you know, your cost price proposal or your proposal itself can catch items you may miss um, and help educate your subcontractors, uh, as well as make sure that you're, you're getting your subcontractors to a point where they're better partners in the future because they're learning important lessons on how to be compliant that they may not be willing to talk to you about, um, but having that third party that they can speak to will you know, help them understand how they need to be compliant and make them a better partner for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Always great to have you on uh, our programs. So appreciate the insight. Okay, and uh, next up we have a longtime colleague and dear friend, Marsha Lindquist. Um, I'm sorry we're running late here, Marsha. So pre appreciate your uh, your patience and waiting. Uh, Marsha's with Granite Leadership Strategies, and I'm going to move on to your best practices and give you the floor. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of my compliance best practices today really circle around the cost accounting part of life in the government contracting world and a little bit in the proposal pricing area and uh, the strategic parts of that proposal pricing that come into play. My first one is a basic. It's the accounting system adequacy compliance. Um, most contractors these days are being asked to fill out um, a disclosure that says whether they have an adequate accounting system and the compliance for that follows along the lines of what's in the SF1408 form. But the most important part of that that most contractors fall down on is not getting their written policies and procedures in place. Uh, that will feed into the evaluation of the items in the SF-1408. Without the written policies and procedures in place, it's very hard for an auditor to determine whether you really are compliant or not. Um, if you say that you have policies, but they're not written, then it's time to get out the, the keyboard and the screen and put them down so that they are written down. Uh, and, and what you stand for in the policies and how you carry out your accounting system uh, in the procedures part of this. Very important part in order to get that accounting system adequacy compliance in order. The second is not very far from that. Uh, incurred cost submittals uh, are something that contractors who do cost reimbursable or flexibly priced contracts are required to do within 180 days of the end of their fiscal year every year. Um, I usually tell my clients, even if they do not have cost reimbursable contracts, to prepare their incurred cost submittals anyway, because it lets you know what you're gonna have to do when you do get a cost plus contract or a flexibly priced contract. Um, it uh, seems like a lot of work, but however, if you do it, you pretty much are ready for it when it comes uh, time for you to do that. Uh, I think it's an important piece of a good, if you will, accounting and control compliance for you to do incurred cost submittals. I think it's very, very important uh, to know what went into that, and it will point out the things that seem to fall apart for you during the year. It will allow you to tick and tie a lot of the information that's required in an incurred cost submittal. It will allow you to do everything from taking a look at your payroll information all the way to taking a look at your contracts and uh, whether you are compliant on those as well. The next one is my one of my favorites these days. It's the cost estimating adequacy compliance. Uh, it's a big one these days, right along with the accounting system adequacy. Uh, contractors are being asked for their cost estimating system, and if it's been approved, 
a lot of uh, the contractors that have come to me recently are asking for that. And frankly, it is not a walk in the park. Uh, it requires its own set of policies and procedures. And I say plus, 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 because there's a lot involved in that. There's a lot that you have to, if you go to the DFARS and you look for the cost estimating system uh, requirements, you'll see there are 17 principles and criteria that have to be complied with. Everything from your system to the human parts of it to the policies and procedures. And um, like my colleagues in the last session talked about um, in terms of uh, what's adequate and what's compliant, it's very, very important to have a three-legged stool here. Going back to Catherine's point, and um, the three-legged stool for cost estimating adequacy is your system, um, be it uh, manual or otherwise, if you will, or electronic in terms of Excel, but the policies and procedures are important. And then lastly, the plus, 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 the third plus is the human factors. Uh, the fourth part of this is um, preparation for CAS coverage. Um, it's a great way to help you become compliant. A lot of contractors will say, well, I don't have to do CAS yet, and you're correct that you may not have to. But if you become CAS compliant, then you will be CAS compliant when it comes time for you, when you win that $50 million contract. Um, putting, again, the policies and procedures in place to be CAS covered is a great way to make sure that you are compliant and ready. Why not do it, <clears throat> excuse me, from the beginning before you have to actually do it? Um, the other, the fifth one here is provisional indirect rates annually. Um, a lot of contractors are required to do that, again, if they have cost reimbursable contracts. Provisional indirect rates mean that you are allowed to bill those rates through to the contracts. In my opinion, again, prepare those indirect rate provisional rates uh, ahead of time. Many of you are preparing them right now. A lot of you uh, will delay getting that done, but if you're preparing your next fiscal year's indirect rates, you will be ready to submit those and bill for those. And even if you don't, have the requirement to do it, it'll get the discipline in order for you to be compliant with doing provisional indirect rates. Um, that's all I have from, from those five points, Jennifer. Marsha, I always love your, uh, your great insights. Uh, thank you for sharing your time to put those together. And what is the most repetitive compliance issue that you see? Well, I, it was, I was hard pressed to pick the most repetitive, but I'm going to go with um, price proposals that do not comply with the requirements of the RFP. Um, what I see in that regard is that either proposals just throw over the transom the pricing and don't address what is in section L and section M. So if you do a compliance matrix each and every time you put together a price proposal and you lay out all of the different sentences and paragraphs that are in section L and section M and you answer them not only in your narrative but in the data that you provide, you will be compliant. And most importantly, Jennifer, provide that compliance matrix in your proposal even if you're not asked for it. Great. That's I, it, Jennifer. I love that, Marsha. Thank you again so much for joining us, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks. Okay, last but not least, a uh, good friend and longtime colleague as well, Ms. Karen Long, has joined us from Streamline Government Contracts. Karen, it's great to have you on our program, and I'll turn the floor over to you for your five best practices on compliance. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. I really appreciate you inviting me here today. Um, it's been very informative. I've, I've uh, listened from the beginning, so it's been a great, uh, great bunch of speakers. So um, again, thanks. Uh, so again, um, Karen Long with Streamline Government Contracts. We are an outsourced solution for contract management support, and we will be celebrating our nine-year anniversary on Monday, October 4th. So excited about that. Uh, so my main um, 
my main best practices are uh, mostly dealing with reporting and tracking. And they're not in any specific order, um, but I'll go ahead and start with uh, number one that you see on the screen, which is share contract briefs with the entire team. And first, let me say that the contracts brief should capture the deliverables for everyone. This means the technical team, HR, contracts, accounting, et cetera, should, um, needs to capture everything. And then uh, what I mean by share it with the with entire team is to share it with all the departments. This way, everyone is literally on the same page. Um, and two, uh, for tracking of like the service contract report or small business, um, subcontracting plan reporting, uh, one technique, and the more contracts you have, the more helpful this is. But it's to set up an Excel worksheet where each worksheet represents a month of the year. And every time you get a new contract, you would add any reporting requirements to that specific worksheet. So for example, service contract reports, let's say you have those in three of the contracts. Um, those are due in October, prior to October 31st. So you would list those three contracts and mention that there's a service contract reporting due. And again, um, as you grow, the bigger you get, the more subcontracts and, uh, uh, and prime contracts you have, the more helpful this will be. And prepare estimates to completion for a limitation of funds. So estimates to completion will allow you to project ahead and to plan ahead. So this will ensure that um, with the limitation of funds clause, which means that you need to report, and it depends on the contract, but it's uh, to, um, to report 30, 60, or 90 days ahead of time when you are projecting that you're going to um, reach 75% utilization of funds. And sometimes it's 85% as well. Uh, at any rate, um, this will keep you on track and help you with the timely reporting. Use numbers and nomenclatures for NDAs, TAs, proposals. And this is pretty self-explanatory, but if you use numbers, it's very easy to track and to see if if you're missing an NDA, if you're missing a TA, or if it didn't get fully executed. And for proposals, it will help you see uh, whether, your, whether the um, proposal you submitted is still valid or not, or whether you might have to extend the validity period in the near future. And last, and this is one of the most important, I'll say, and I think it's often overlooked, User tracking sheet for resumes and candidates reviewed for um, labor uh, time and material contracts or labor or hour contracts or really any contract that requires specific educational requirements and experience requirements for the people working. And what this helps is it helps track and keeps a centralized location for anybody that you have reviewed the resume for and you confirm that they meet the category requirements. And this is really helpful. What can happen is if you, if someone doesn't meet the labor category requirements, even after the contract is over, the government or prime contract, and usually the prime contract would come back because the government's asking them, they don't meet the uh, the category requirements, you can be asked to um, pay back the, the difference between the labor category that they did meet and what you actually build them at. Um, so again, this is really important. And again, even when the contract or task order is over, um, remember that they can still come back and ask you for that information. Um, and uh, we generally, um, we have our own tracking sheet that we use for this at Streamline uh, Government Contracts. We generally share this with our clients. However, I appreciate everybody's time and especially, uh, again, I know I'm the last speaker, so I really appreciate everybody who has uh, stuck in there. And so feel free, if you're interested in this tracking sheet, to send me an email uh, with the subject employee tracking sheet 
and either me or my office manager, Scott, will send you our template. Great, thanks, Karen. And uh, we actually will have one more behind you from the government side, Andy Kirkpatrick from GSA, but you're the last rounding out compliance. I appreciate you hanging on the line as well as all the other folks that are still with us. Um, so quick question to you, how do you keep track of all your contract requirements and reporting so nothing slips through the cracks? So what we do at Streamline is we prepare a monthly executive report. And what this forces you to do is to review each contract in depth every month. So again, I agree with what Heather said earlier about tracking what compliance requirements your contracts have. I would go um, a little bit further than she did and say this needs to be really reviewed on a monthly basis instead of an annual basis. As, as she mentioned, there are people who turn over during the year, et cetera. And as I tell um, our clients, uh, you know, I can't keep everything in our head. So um, again, uh, so we put together an executive report. What it includes is contract activity, comments, and recommendations. And in addition to being a, um, a good tracking uh, mechanism, it's also an effective communication and historical record. Great, thank uh, you. So so thanks, Jennifer. And uh, if anybody has questions or you're interested in getting more information, please reach out Great. and don't forget to request your tracking sheet. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And thanks also to all of our sponsors. We still have one more speaker here up from the government, uh, GSA. We've got Andy Kirkpatrick. But before I get to him again, I want to thank all of our great sponsors that made today's event possible, C3, Integrated Solutions. They were also a speaker covering uh, CMMC. We've got Bit Solutions. They were a speaker, as was the Federal Business Council, Bit Speed, Ocean 5. Uh, and I think that was it for speakers. We also want to thank uh, Boone Group, Government White Papers, Work Plan, SWIC Tech, FNB Bank, and GovFlex. Uh, and now, Andy Kirkpatrick, thank you uh, for hanging on the line here. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Jennifer, I, I, I thought I was off the hook. <laughs> Dude, I'm doing again. Which is another the last speaker. I'm like, oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. I didn't forget about you. You are here and uh, front and center. The floor is yours. I feel like I should have a drum roll. I know you're a musician. Um, yes. So I should have had I some should. musical entry for you. <laughs> I got to work on that kind of like the, you know, like in baseball, you have like the walk up music. Yeah. You know, I have to, I, I have to, have, I, I should, I should have some kind of theme song, but uh, uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for, for, um, for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, as Jeff, you mentioned, I did get to, uh, to, uh, to be here for a lot of this. And I've, and I've also attended and presented at, uh, at, at prior um, engagements as well. And these are just amazing things. So, I know uh, we're way behind time, so I'm going to jump right in. These are the top five practices. I'm sorry, I too little too fast. I am uh, at JSA. I am in the business development area. I'm a business development specialist, which means basically that I work with all the companies that are either on GSA schedules or about to become onto uh, GSA schedules, and I help them uh, prepare if they are um, going to be on schedule or help them develop, if they're on schedule, uh, their business practices. And so it was, um, it was a neat kind of transfer. I did spend the prior nine years as a customer service director, which meant I worked with, a, with all of the government agencies. So I've gotten kind of both sides of the, uh, of the ledger here. And so the first thing that I wanna do is really um, make sure that you, um, that you use my um, contact information to reach out if anything related to GSA is going awry. If there's anything that you are uh, trying to track down that, uh, that you don't get paid to do, that's when you know you have to reach out to me. So uh, having said that, the top five best practices, uh, number one, sell that FAR 8.4 you're selling simplicity. You are selling to the contracting uh, to the to the contracting officers on all sides here. Just a real simple way of doing business. Instead of having those uh, those contracting officers do a lot of the homework, a lot of the the back work. Uh, the fact that you have a GSA schedule 
allows you to kind of circumvent that. That's the good part. That's the that's the reward you get for the uh, admittedly arduous process process of becoming on schedule. So folks get on schedule and then they forget to sell the simplicity. So sell the simplicity. And related to that, number two is know your CO. Know those contracting officers. No, because those are the people who really uh, put the um, to, to put the tires t on the road. And so it's wonderful to um, have a great solution and to really uh, convince the that first decision maker to go with you. However, uh, what's going to kind of pump you uh, and, and, and kind of get you off that short list is your ability to talk to and relate to the CEO. Um, number three, update that price list yearly. Absolutely. Um, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, I, we do have a uh, the, the new e-modification uh, process that is there for uh, for folks, but make sure that folks know where you are, and and make sure that you are updating that that price at least yearly. Um, hopefully, it's it's um, it's a little more than that, but at least yearly. Uh, and coming in at number four, keeping all your POCs updated. Uh, so many times from the GSA angles, and I, and again, I've seen this from the CSD angle, I've seen this from the business development angle, I've seen it from all of my colleagues in my networks and 10 years of working with GSA. One of the great frustrations is, is that folks do not keep their POCs to us updated. And so we are shooting out emails, we're, sh we're sending out um, uh, invitations I, at, as the B, as the, Business development person, I've created and I present two trainings a, a, a month, and we send them out to our vendors, and I get loads and loads and loads of no longer here, it's not the person, all that kind of good stuff. So please keep the POCs, who's whoever's in charge of, of dealing with GSA, make sure that you are taking care of that um, and, and letting us know. And then fifth, and uh, certainly not least, reach out to us. It's where I began, and this is where I'm gonna end. Reach out to the business development team. I realize GSA is a very big, very large, non-agile animal. What the BD team, and as an um, a extension to that, the CSD teams do is bring a little bit of that agility to the process, and so, uh, the, the line that I use a lot um, in and kind of dealing with the government is that it's sometimes it's it's like trying to teach an elephant how to jump rope. So um, not very agile. So it's really incumbent upon you to reach out to the business development team, reach out to your CSD, and and make sure that you know that you have all the support that you need. Great, I love it, Andy. And uh, let me move over to your uh, question here. What's the biggest misconception people have regarding GS? Uh, 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 the biggest one is that uh, once you get the schedule, everything is, um, it, your work is done, basically. Uh, that's the biggest misconception is that GSA is, uh, it, GSA is the referee. And sometimes um, throughout the process, we are kind of misconstrued or, or misperceived out there because we do so many things that it, it is um, it, it's difficult for folks to have the uh, the right conception. But we are really the referees in the in the um, in this uh, transactions or transactions rather. And so it's really coming upon us to make sure that the uh, playing field is as level as possible and that you are able to compete to your highest. Uh, to, to your highest uh, opportunity or your highest potential. Because really, uh, GSA it will only be successful uh, unless our uh, vendors are successful. So um, we are on your side, um, but we are ultimately on the side of competition. Fantastic, uh, great points. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for um, hanging in there until the end. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good weekend. A happy new year to you. Uh, thanks again to all our sponsors, uh, C3 Integrated Solutions, your go-to for CMMC, uh, DFARS and NIST 800-171 Compliance, our friends over at Capture Exec, 
which is where you want to go to for managing your uh, federal sales uh, work plan, your go-to for uh, all your finance-related uh, matters, including incurred cost submission, uh, contract management, and DCAA compliance. Bid Speed, you heard from them today, uh, another platform to manage your opportunities. And GovFlex, uh, I'll call it your matchmaking for um, for freelancers that are uh, kind of operating in the GovCon space as consultants uh, and matching them to companies that need those types of services. This can range from proposal writers to compliance and uh, other consultants in the GovCon space. Uh, Federal Business Council, uh, they are the folks you heard from David today that put on the government contracting events and their notable event that most people are aware of is the government procurement fair every year. Um, so keep them um, in mind. Uh, Gov White Papers, uh, which grew out of Gov Events, uh, they're a newsletter advertiser of ours, a great uh, platform to upload your content. Uh, content is king, and you can contact Donna Monday if you've got any questions uh, about Gov White Papers or visit their website. The Boone Group is your go to again for the employee benefit products. They've been around for 35 years, and uh, uh, keep them in mind uh, again for your uh, benefits. Ocean 5 Strategies, that was uh, Chris Brinker that we heard from today during the marketing session. Uh, they are a great resource for helping you with uh, optimizing your website, SEO, uh, some digital marketing campaigns, and just uh, getting you in front of the right, getting the eyeballs to your, uh, to your website. Swick Tech, uh, another go-to for CMMC. Um, and they do have, uh, they are a registered provider organization and two of their own registered practitioners uh, that are designated by the CMMC accreditation body. Last but not least, uh, First National Bank, your contacts there are James uh, Ari and Justine Baker. Their contact information is there on the right hand side of your screen. They do a lot with uh, federal government contractors and are a 30. 43 billion full service commercial bank. Uh, they've got a, a full suite of products and services for government contractors. So um, please keep those services in mind. And also, they also include the uh, SBA loans. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. We realize we went over with time. Uh, hopefully that was in your best interest to get additional content from these great speakers and influencers in the government contracting space. Thanks for being with us. We're going to have this recording up as soon as it gets converted over to an MP4, which uh, hopefully will be by the end of today. Thanks again, everybody, and thanks to our sponsors.